That's the greatest any DCCO has ever done. Thank you. I'm going to officially call the Assistant Housing Governance Board meeting. Uh, would you please call the roll? Board Member DeCicio. Here. Board Member Gallego. Here. Board Member Nowakowski. Board Member Pastor. Here. Board Member Stark. Here. Board Member Valenzuela. Here. Board Member Waring. Here. Board Member Wiesahan. Chairwoman Williams. Here. Uh, I believe we have the minutes from the last meeting, March 21st, 2018. Do you have a motion? Motion. Do, do you want to make the motion, Ms. Weston? Move for approval. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Uh, we now have a resolution to approve and to adopt the Phoenix Public Housing Authority's proposed asset management budget for fiscal year 2018-19. I move for the motion. Second. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Uh, we now have item five, another resolution for approval for the city council to authorize the city manager to apply for and accept up to 250 additional section eight mainstream vouchers and up to 100 additional section eight family unification program vouchers from the US Department of Housing and Urban Development and further authorize the city manager to execute all required documents necessary or appropriate to implement the award and authorize the city treasurer to accept and the city controller to disperse all funds related to this item. Do I have a motion? Okay. I have a motion and second. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Uh, resolution to approve uh, up for approval of the city council to authorize the city manager to issue an RFP to create supportive housing for spatial population utilizing up to 100 U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development project-based Section 8 housing choice vouchers. Further recommending the city council authorize the city manager to execute all documents necessary or appropriate to implement the provisions of this resolution and further recommend the City Council authorize the City Manager to begin negotiations with the recommended proposers. Do you have a motion? I move for the motion. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you very much. I believe that's the end of this agenda, so uh, we will stand adjourned. We will now to go to our formal council meeting. Uh, roll call. Councilman DeCicio. Here. Councilwoman Gallego. Here. Councilman Nowakowski. Here. Councilwoman Pastor. Here. Councilwoman Stark. Here. Councilman Valenzuela. Here. Councilman Waring. Here. Mayor Williams. Here. Uh, our interpreter is here. Are you Alex? Alex Torres. Uh, do you want to introduce yourself? Buenas tardes. Para las personas que necesiten interpretación al español, atrás se les puede proporcionar el equipo. Gracias. All right, they're giving me instructions in case I'm messing up the first time. <laughs> Next on our agenda is citizen comments. Uh, this is uh, citizens' time, up to three minutes each. Uh, we will, if we run out of time for the cards I have received, uh, there will be another period at the end of this meeting uh, for the opportunity to, to finish the dialogue if you have an opportunity now. First speaker is Kim Baker. Good evening. Uh, I do have a document I'd like to submit. Thank you, uh, Vice Mayor and Council. Uh, as I said once before, I'm not always here with, uh, with bad news, but today I just feel led to do this 
because we need change. Oh, say, can you see? Jesus died for you and me. What so proudly we hail at his glorious resurrection. Death could not hold him down. With victory he is crowned, giving proof to his church that he is still here. He was beaten all night long. God's desire is to make us strong. And through his bloodshed, we can now live forever. Having faith in God's Son, you'll experience victory won. As creation eagerly awaits for the revealing of God's Son. Oh, wait, and you will see the King of glory and his kingdom come home at last, home at last we Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. Uh, next up is Adriana Gonzalez. Um, first, I'd like to say welcome, Mayor Williams. Um, but as a city council, you have a lot of culture of violence within the Phoenix Police Department. It's a violent, unaccountable police force. Po Phoenix police are on track to kill more than they ever have in one year. I'd like to remind y'all that it's June 6th. How many Phoenix residents have to die before you muster up the courage to act? Your silence is deafening. Your inaction is shocking. Phoenix residents, your constituents, are literally dying and you do nothing. After every murder committed by your police department, we are left to heal with no support from you. We asked for a compensation fund for this exact reason. We wish we didn't have such a horrible example of why this compensation fund is so important. We have asked repeatedly for this fund. We ask again today, even though we know our ask falls on closed ears and closed hearts. Robbie Brown and his family deserve justice, but there will be no justice here today because of your moral cowardice. Our community deserves accountability for police violence, but there will be no accountability here today because of your lack of political will. Prove us wrong. Include a compensation fund for our communities to heal from the violence of your police. Pat Vint. Hello there, Sal. We're gonna ask for something today, okay? Anyway, um, I've been here many times. My name is Joseph Patrick Vint, 8340 North 16th Street, right at the end of 16th Street in Butler. So all of us here are not, what would you say, uh, picked on or what the word is, but everybody has a reason for being here. So I'm hoping that the mayor and the council are all listening because I'm putting out an olive branch today. One month ago, we got invited to Sal DeCicio's office and his two daughters are here to see you, so I'll be nice to you. Anyway, you didn't show up, but your chief of staff, Samuel G. Gardner Stone, he made a stone tried to put me out of the office before we even got started, but we settled that down, and then Ed Zerker come. 
What a wonderful guy he was that day. What happened to him? Anyway, uh, since that meeting was a month ago and Samuel G. Stone and Ed Zerker heard it that you were going to, they were going to answer us back within a week or 10 days. And do you think that that's correct, that it's been a month and we have not heard? We don't care what you, well, we do care what you say, but at least you could say, go jump in a river, or we're going to do something, or we're not going to do anything. But at least answer people. And Thelda, when you speak into that mic, would you speak up? Because we can't hear what you're saying. I think my voice is carrying, and you have a voice, and we're very good friends. You know, we had a nice hug up there and all that good stuff. Don't tell everything you know. <laughs> What'd she say? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, okay. boy, thanks, Delta. And Ed Zerker, wherever. What happened to him? Well, there he is. Wow, you're hiding behind him glasses. But you were there that day. You heard that, Ed. And you know you're getting paid a lot of money. It's a wonder that there is any after your two Please predecessors don't left. What? I'm asking the audience not to interrupt you. Go ahead, Pat. Go. Thank, thank you, thank you, thank you. Anyway, Sal, I guess it says up there, citizen the comments, and there's something below or above that says you don't, you don't need to answer or you don't want to answer. But would you say right now in front of your two daughters there that you're going to do the best you can? And that's great plenty because you have total control of District 6 that John and myself are both in. So it's simple if you would just listen and look up the word in the dictionary, fix, F-I-X. I need you. Very I simple. Like so a red light. Thanks, Delta. Bye-bye. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. You too. John Resnick. Okay, I got a I can't see memorandum here from Paul Lee. It says, Zoning Ordinance 702B2 and City Code Section 36145 specifically exempts families, residents, or rear yard from industrial profit regulations. The city staff, no author to issue a dust profit vote. The city staff has no authority to issue dust proofing violation in our ordinance. Under ARS 49411, the city must provide a dust proofing regulation to the annual report on ADEQ. I don't believe we received a comment from ADEQ. Okay, I'm gonna stop right there. On top, it reads, City can't regulate less than state law, only more. That's what's written on this memorandum. So I can see why the city isn't doing anything for my property. Now, Pat Vint has got his uh, property. He's got a large route. He's, he's got an acre or more than an acre. And he was threatened by Ravenstein on $2,500 fine or six months in jail. He was regulated. It cost him $3,000 to dustproof his lot. Not only did they dustproof his lot, they used the wrong gravel on there. And that's where he is today. How can we do this? He says so here. And what about 3039? 30, that's an ordinance 39 that we have that's supposed to cover this dust proof. So you take the ordinances that you want, not the ones specific, specifically assigned to here to do the job. So I think what you ought to do is do something. Nobody ever told me I couldn't 
that is not going to be dust proof. And then they used him, used me as the bad guy. The guy next door said I was bothering him when they were doing things. I never did nothing. I took pictures, and I've got 100 pictures. I've got pictures that I could take. I'm going to be through a minute. And the city has not even talked to me. One person has not even said nothing to me, sick Sal. You ought to do so, some, get, some done, get something done once in a while. <clears throat> Alondra Sanchez. Hello, I am here today because the last time that we were here to raise our concerns and make our demands, we were told that we were preaching nonsense and that we were attacking, yet you are the one still sitting here while Rabbi Brown was shot down by your police department, while dozens of people that were in that bus were test like testimony, were witnesses to the police shooting, the police violence that happens because of your police department. That's why the, the trust fund, the fund that we are talking about for the traumatization by your police department is necessary. Just one week of coming to ask you guys, weeks, to protect us. To, we followed your process and still nothing has come from it. We see your true colors. We are watching you. The community is watching you. And if you continue to fail your responsibilities, ignore our demands, you are signing our death sentences. Thank you. Okay, we have time for one more. Uh, I think it's Maria Sanchez. Hello, um, welcome, Mayor Williams. Um, you have allowed a culture of violence within the Phoenix Police Department, and it's unacceptable. On May 29th, Robbie Brown was killed in front of a bus of full passengers, and I have not heard one of you speak about this, how you're helping his family, the people in that bus who went home with this trauma, even myself. When I went down there, I grew up riding the city bus all my life. When I found out where this shooting happened, I realized it was the same route that I would take with my family, with my friends to go to the mall, the library back behind that mall. That's the same route we would take. So when I found out where it was, I was like, oh my God, like what are they doing for these people? Like even I had a breakdown that day. My son had to watch me because it hurt that much to see that you guys are not doing anything for these people. And I just wanna know if you were finally have the courage enough to do this fund that we've been asking you for weeks after six months, I'm sorry, after the last two months, and 600 people have been speaking about it, to give us compensation fund for this trauma, for people like Robbie Brown's family, the people on that bus. There was someone actually in the bus that said, the police said, this is quote, the police said, don't talk to anybody about this, but telling my story is the only way I can deal with it. I don't have anyone else to talk to. I haven't been able to sleep. The sound of four to five shots still echo in my ears. What are you doing for that person that spoke up and asked you for help? Nothing. So I know firsthand that I need this conversation for, for myself because trust me, when I went home that night, I was broken. I can't even imagine how I would have been if I would have been in that bus and I would have seen that happen. I would have been done. Show us some courage for once. Step up today and, inc and include the compensation fund for victims of police violence in this budget. Uh, that's all the time we have right now for public comment. I will hold the cards until the end of the meeting and give you an opportunity to speak then. Uh, go on to the 24-hour paragraph. 
The titles of the following warrants and resolution numbers on the agenda were available to the public at least 24 hours prior to this council meeting and therefore may be read by title or agenda item only. Ordinances number G, 6463 through 6473, S, 44586, 44616, and 44629 through 44741, and resolutions 21645 through 21649. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Valenzuela. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to ask that we pull items 220 and 221 out of order. Can we? Okay, we have a motion and a second to do so. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Do you want to continue? Yes, my motion is to continue. I know that we have uh, several community leaders from uh, the 107th Avenue area, Vita Paz area. We also have the applicant here, and I know that uh, conversations will, will continue, and uh, the motion is to continue to June 27th, and this is for items 220 and 221. Okay. Do we have anyone uh, from the council? Wish? Okay. We have lots of cards. Does anyone want to speak on the continuance? Okay. Hearing none, all in favor to moving this uh, till... Uh, June, what was it? 27th. 27th. Please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. The item is moved uh, to the June 27th agenda. Thank you for coming. Uh, we have no boards and commissions today. Go to the liquor license applications. Hi, Mish. You have a motion? Motion to approve items 1 through 25, except items 20 and 25 and for item 25 uh, the applicant has asked to continue this item to june 27th 2018 meeting does the council person concur with the i support the continuance of item 25. Okay. we have cards no, no cards? Okay, all in favor of the motion, please say. Second. I made the motion. She made the motion? I need a second. second. Who's I second? second. You, you did voice in. Yeah. Come on, Chris. Women are fast. Stick <laughs> <laughs> with us, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Brings us to ordinances resolutions. Oh, item 20. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Okay, Councilman Nolkowski, this is in your district. Did you want to make comments or have a presentation? Um, I don't need a presentation. I just have some um, comments or some questions for um, Denise. So Denise, we received a couple um, protest letters, and I just want—I was just wondering how long has this um, store been established in the neighborhood? Mayor, members of the council, Councilman Nowakowski, this location for Discount King Market was originally licensed with the Series 10 Beer and Wine Store license in August of 1989, and since then it has been licensed with different owners until now. Currently, there's a pending application and the applicant of the pending application it may operate with an interim permit as well. And is the applicant here? Is the applicant here for item 20? Yes. Would you like to come up to the podium, please, so we can hear what you're saying? My name is Angie, and I am the. I'm managing the store. I'm also renovating it. Um, although we're petitioning for a liquor license, I'll be in hopes of petitioning for a community grant for redevelopment to provide nutrition, which it is. Um, this community is very deprived based upon the homeless rate, the disabled, and children with working parents. And being a small business, it is very hard. Um, that location has had problems in the past, but I think through uh, renovation and so forth, it will help me petition for a minority grant and do something more of a community development because it is 
up for grabs. The building um, will be selling soon, and that's my biggest fear. Someone will go in there, place a dollar store. Um, they don't really know the needs of the community. Um, I have a lot of um, elderly people that cannot make it to a grocery store. So although we're petitioning for a liquor license, I've segregated the alcohol from any theft from any minors and it's controlled by the, the amount that we're putting out towards inventory. So, so is so. it Annie? Angie. Angie. Mm -hmm. um, basically, um, some of the concerns are safety in that area, and okay. those are the letters that we were receiving. Yeah, I any, upgraded the security any system. Any means of, or what kind of measures are you going to take um, to make it more safe? I'm going to enforce a no loitering policy. Also, um, I've upped the security around the building. Um, also renovating it right now, which has been kind of a little community effort getting it done. But um, I'm upping the lighting in the area and um, also just for the safety for the, those that do walk, I'm, I'm hoping and establishing some trees in the area for shade. It's, I, have some big, I have some big goals set for the community. My father was a county manager, so I'm very familiar with grant funding so I hope to turn the neighborhood around because I don't want to lose it. I've enjoyed the customers that are in the, in the area. And like I said, it's, um, since it's a historical district, there's no knocking down those buildings. So right. the light rail is set to be, I guess what I was told on Van Buren. Um, again, that's still not providing any nutrition for those that are in the community that, again, are single parents don't have a vehicle. You know, the children come in, they, I want to provide apples, oranges, stuff like that, but, so, it, the liquor license, the security, I've already upped it. Um, again, I'm renovating right now, the lights will be a lot brighter for the community, and plus I'm always outside watching, you know, looking, so. And then one other thing is, um, are you committed in building a relationship with the community action officer? Yes. Okay, with that, um, I think the, most of the concerns of the community was the lighting, making sure that there was cameras, and basically having um, on file that the police were able to come on yes. on the property to, if there's anybody that needs yes, to be arrested. Yes, I met with the, the police enforcement, and if they need any surveillance, I'm able to provide it all around the building, and uh, you know, either way on the street. All right, with that, I'd like to approve um, item number 20. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further comment? Hearing none. Thank you. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. <clears throat> I believe we are now ready for ordinances, resolutions, new business, and planning and zoning. Uh, Mayor, I would like to make a motion to approve items 26 through 223, except the following. Items 26, 31, 35, 44, 50, 55, 73 through 78, 95, 102, 103, 106, 109, 119, 120, 121, 129, 136, 137, 141, 143 through 145, 154, 211 and 222 through 223. Item 135 is requested to be continued to June 20th, uh, 2018, and exclude the, these items for public comment. Uh, 75, 79, 102, 103, 106, 130, 133, 159, uh, 207, 208, and 120 through 223. It makes it sound like we're not passing anything, doesn't it? <laughs> did you say 122? I did not. Okay. Yeah, and, and items 122. Okay. Right, right. Okay. Is, is you settled? Voice or roll? Roll call. Second. Did you second? Second. 
DeCicio? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Valenzuela? Yes. Waring? Yes. Mayor Williams? Yes. Okay, item 26. Sec uh, item 26. I move to approve. Okay, do I have a second? Second. Comments? Councilman Murray? I just had a comment. This is a big issue, not just for us, but for a lot of folks. We've had a pretty good record so far, yeah, you and I, and I think Councilman Guy also serve on the audit committee. You know, I've asked for us to have an update about this uh, shortly because the technology keeps changing. I just want to make sure that we have, you know, the best in this particular sphere, and I know that's always tricky, but, um, but this is an important issue, and I guess I just felt like it shouldn't just be on consent. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, no further comments? Yeah. Oh, I certainly agree with Councilman Waring. We've seen this item, uh, which is related to cybersecurity, be a really important issue. Peer cities such as Atlanta have frankly been devastated by some issues related to cybersecurity. So I want to thank the city manager for taking this very seriously. Yes. Roll call. DeCicio? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Valenzuela? Waring, Mayor Williams. Yes. Item 31. Move approval for item 31. Second. Motion and a second. Did, did anyone want to make a comment? No? Okay, roll call. DeCicio. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring, Mayor Williams. Yes. Item 35. Move approval of item 35. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Did no one's indicating they want to speak? Uh, roll call. DeCicio. Yes. Gallego. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Yes. Mayor Williams. Yes. Oh, uh, the item 44. Oh, I'm sorry. It, it did pass to five to two. That's right. Can't subtract from nine. Okay. We, Move item. Yeah, we can. Can we l combine any of these? Well, I'm assuming or? we can, but um, you want to. Just to ruin it. Okay. Eventually. Item 44. Second. I have a motion and a second. Did you want to make a comment, Councilman? 44. 44. 44. Just a quick question. I think, Ed, you're aware that I'm going to ask you the question, anyways. But, um, you know, I've been asking for actuarial data for years now. And I want to make sure that this is going to be able to allow us to model all our pension questions that we're going to have. Um, and I know it's not going to be 100% precise because we've got PSPRS on the other end of it. I just want to make sure that when we ask questions about longevity, years of service, you know, those types of things, we'll be able to model different types of um, costs, I guess, associated with our pension plan. Mayor Councilman DeCicio, while this is not actuarial data itself, it uses data to be able to model, as you've said, and it does it much faster than we've been able to do it. So, uh, yes, it will allow us to model uh, many questions about pensions and what ifs in the pension system. And that it shouldn't take eight hours, uh, part of the eight hour rule, to model a couple once, questions. Once we have the, the software, no, questions. it should not take okay. an, eight, an eight hour rule to, to model uh, <laughs> Thank requests. You. That's what I need. Any other questions? Hearing none, roll call. <laughs> DeCicio. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Waring, Mayor Williams. Yes, 8-0. Item 50, I move approval for item 50. Second. Yeah. Uh, Councilman DeCicio, did you want to make comments on item 50? Well, it just that it seems like a lot of money just to be able to improve the margin of error in there at what, 0.6%. It's not even negligible. Um, it just doesn't seem like we should be doing something like that. Um, I get it that, you know, there's this assumption that just because you increase your uh, pool of respondents, 
you're going to get a better sample, but that's not necessarily true. And the amount of monies that are being spent on this can be better used on other things. I just don't think that for a 0.6% difference, you should be spending any money as a city on that, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, anyone else want to make a comment? Hearing none, roll call. Hmm? Yeah, we will. DeCicio. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Yes. Mayor Williams. Yes, 7 1, I believe is the tally. Um, next item. No, move item 55. Second. Anyone want to make a comment? Hearing none, roll call. DeCicio. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Yes. Mayor Williams. Yes. I believe that was seven to one. Next item is item seventy-three. Oh, this is the formal meeting. Uh, it's a public hearing on the 2018 to 2023 capital improvement program. I now declare the meeting open. Are there any cards? No cards, okay. Uh, is there anyone in the audience that wish to speak on this? Hearing none, meeting is closed. Uh, item 74 is the adoption of the 2018-2023 Capital Improvement Program. Mayor, I move adoption of the resolution 21-64-6, the 2018-2023-2023 Capital Improvement Program. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Uh, will you call the roll, please? DeCicio. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Mayor Williams. Yes. I believe that's seven to one. Uh, item 75 is a public hearing on the adoption of the tentative 2018-2019 annual budget ordinances. I will now declare the hearing open. And we do have cards on this. Uh, Craig Tripkin. Would you like to come down? You're passing. You're just in favor. Okay. Uh, we have cards that um, are opposed but do not want to speak. Jose Romero's, Marco Hernandez, Ben Laughlin, Paris Wallace, Bertha Rita, Mario Castro, Jennifer Hernandez, Maxima Guerrero, oh, I don't know how to pronounce one, V-I-R-I-D-I-A-N-A, -I, -I, -A, I believe it says, Hernandez, and Michael Ingram. All say they do not want to speak, but are opposed. Is there anyone else in the audience that wishes to speak? Okay, hearing none. Uh, would you please call the roll? Close oh, I have to close the public hearing. And okay. item 76 is the adoption of the tentative 2018-2019 annual budget. Mayor, I move the items uh, that item 76 being ordinance S. 44632, the tentative 2018-2019 annual budget be adopted. Second. We have a motion and a second. Please call the roll. Uh, Mayor, I just have a couple comments on this and why I'm going to be okay. voting no on it. Go ahead. Uh, just a couple things right off the bat, and I don't think the public's even aware of this. In this budget, there's an allowance in there for over $2 billion in new debt that the city of Phoenix created by imposing this debt structure on the police and fire pension plans. Uh, these plans are already stressed and they're having significant issues, but this $2 billion that are being added, you're going to be paying for this in the future if this budget goes through as planned. Additionally, 
the city of Phoenix could have done a much better job of hiring more police officers and even some with the firefighters, but they did not. There should have been more monies allocated in here. And if you look at what the city of Phoenix has done, when it looks at uh, the police officers on our streets, what it does is it looks at a financial model, like, okay, here's what we want to be able to get financially for the city, instead of looking at a needs assessment and an assessment of what the population needs and what the public needs. So what they've been doing is basing everything off of a financial structure rather than a needs structure. I've asked for this repeatedly at the city of Phoenix here. I've said, look, tell us what we're going to need by the way of police officers. Is it 3,125 officers that we need or is it uh, 3,300? What is the number that we need? And everything is based off of financial, uh, off of uh, a numeric number, which I understand. But at the same time, it doesn't give the public a real uh, analysis and a view of what the city of Phoenix really needs within the, the structure of our police department. So there are certain things, obviously, in this budget that I like. But when you look at it overall, it creates the structural imbalance that the city of Phoenix has had year after year after year. And there's no fix in that. And what the city of Phoenix did by adding this $2 billion they extended the terms. Now, we all understand what happens when you extend the terms of a loan, right? What happens? Your debt increases. You're able to get a lower payment by, by extending that out. What the city of Phoenix did by increasing its debt, it's burdened the future uh, individuals in the city of Phoenix, children, our families. We're going to be having to pay for this long term. Second thing, what it does is it destabilizes the police and fire pensions that are already having significant financial problems. You heard me talk about that earlier on. So why add that on, that $2 billion worth of debt, why add that on to the police and fire budgets? Why do that, not budget, but their pension plans? None of the staff that recommended this, not one single staff member said that they should do this to their own pension plan. Not one. But see the police officers here in the room today? They're going to be carrying this debt burden. We're going to be carrying the debt burden. And what happens if their, their pension plans, which are already significantly underwater, get worse? Why destabilize their pension plans? They had nothing to do with this. So from my perspective, the, the budget in itself is wrong. It's the wrong direction. And it increases the. Uh, uh, the insuredness of the City of Phoenix future, well, I, I believe we have a, a structural deficit within the City of Phoenix, and that is why year after year the City of Phoenix have, has had to deal with uh, these financial problems. And it solves it by, and everyone takes these accolades. You hear everybody up here say, oh, we did this, we solved it. They solved it by adding debt. That doesn't solve the problem. It does not solve the problem. It just shows you and points out the structural deficit that the city of Phoenix has been operating under and why it needs to be fixed long term. Thank you, Mayor. I'm voting no. Any other comments? Hearing none. Roll call. DeCicio. No. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Um, I want to explain my vote. Uh, my vote is in opposition to the city's manager's budget, and it's not because of what it contains, uh, but rather entirely because of what is missing. A large group of concerned citizens, like so many others, attended this budget hearing and made their voices heard. And while the chance to speak their concerns, none of their requests were ever considered. Um, through this vote, the mayor and council are essentially attempting to silence an entire community that is simply something that I cannot abide by. Uh, I believe in equity and unity and how, uh, really on how the same council can vote in favor of one item uh, that supports inclusion and being counted, but on another item uh, promoting the same things in the same meeting is beyond my comprehension. Um, and I'm speaking about the meeting, the previous meeting. At least, we should at least hear our community and work with our community on the concerns that are there. I, can su I support everything present in the budget, but I cannot back omitting something further, and that erodes community trust. So thank you. Any other comments? None? <coughs> Roll call, please. Start. Yes. <laughs> Valenzuela? Yes. Waring? Mayor Williams? Yes. So it's 6 5 3. 
Okay. Item, move item 77. Second. The adoption of the tentative 2018-2019 capital funds budget. Yes, Mayor, I move that item 77 being ordinance S-44723, the tentative 2018-2019 capital funds budget be adopted. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any comments? Please call the roll. DeCicio. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Mayor Williams. Yes. Brings us to item oh, 7 1. Okay. Um, item 78. This is the adoption of the tentative 2018 2019 reappropriated funds budget. Mayor, I move that item 78 being ordinance S44633, the tentative 2018-2019 reappropriated re funds budget be adopted. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any comments? Councilman Waring? Can I ask Jeff for a brief explanation? You may. Uh, Councilman Waring, members of the council, the reappropriated funds budget allows us to take funds that were budgeted and encumbered against the contract in the current fiscal year or prior fiscal year and allows us to roll that appropriation forward so those bills can be paid. So basically, uh, if I summarize, Jeff, this is, uh, we wouldn't be paying bills, we basically wouldn't be paying bills on projects that we owe money on if we don't pass this. That so is this correct. Isn't, this isn't the budget, this is stuff that's already been decided in the past, we'd just be welshing on. That is correct. Thank you. Any further questions? Hearing none, roll call. DeCicio. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Yes. Mayor Williams. Yes, 8-0. I believe it's the count. Uh, takes us to? Item number 79. I move item number 79. Oh, and we do have one card. Leonard Clark. Oh, we need a second. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, this item, I believe, is to approve funding for the, uh, more specifically, the jail for Maricopa County because hopefully... Special election of the City Council. A, yeah. This oh, is this is the special election of the City Council? To elect a new mayor. Oh, 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 my, my, I got it, I switched it. Well, I was going to speak on that, so uh, I just, uh, I'm not trying to take sides here, but I believe the person that Justice Kennedy most resembles is Thelda Williams. So I hope that you will be, you know, I, because uh, you're in the middle, you're moderate, and I think people from both sides respect you on that. So a little uh, biased there, and it's not fair because it's hard for me to be self-righteously angry when Delta Williams is the mayor. It's like, it's just hard for me. <laughs> well, that's very kind of you. Thank you for the kind words. Uh, item 79, we have a motion to approve. We have a second, I believe. Uh, roll call. DeCicio. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Yes. Mayor Williams. Yes. 8-0. Move item 95. Second. We have a motion and a second on item 95. Any comments? Roll yes. call. Um, no. Item 95 is a, a pedestrian safety project on Rosier Road in District 8. This is one where the community has really spoken to us about particularly safe passages to schools and parks. And I just want to thank the street department for moving this forward. Thank you. Anyone else? Hearing none, roll call, please. DeCicio. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Yes. Mayor Williams. Yes. Seven to one. Uh, next item is item 102. Motion to approve. We do have some cards. Second. That's a second. 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 Um, Joseph Witt. Mm -hmm. 
Afternoon, Mayor, City Council. Uh, item 102 is important. It brings the fire dispatchers to parity with the police dispatchers. It's something that we've been trying to get uh, completed for the last 23 years. Uh, jobs are fairly similar. Uh, we're just as busy as they are. We have 26 different jurisdictions that we dispatch for. We answer 911 calls and dispatch fire EMS even through three counties, Yavapai, Maricopa, and uh, Pinal counties. We average about 1,300 calls a day on a national average. Normally, they take 3,000 calls in an eight-hour period. We're taking nearly 5,000 calls in a four-hour period. The rest of the time is spent on radios. Last year, we logged roughly 480,000 calls, and this year, we're destined to break that total as the call totals increase each year. So I would urge you to uh, vote yes on Thank number 102. You. Thank you so much for your time. Margie Potter. Who is also a nurse? I am. Um, hi, I'm Margie Potter. I'm um, in Council District 8. Um, I've been a dispatcher for 23 years. Um, unfortunately, this parity issue has been going on for the 23 years. It started in 1995 when I was hired. Um, we tried to rectify this in 1997 with a budget and research study. Um, again, unfortunately, this was the first and only time that budget and research came to visit and observed uh, what we do for the parity. So fast forward now to 2018, we dispatched for 26 cities in three counties, as Joe stated, and over the last 23 years, I've answered roughly 100,000 uh, 911 calls for service. In addition to this, we also return and simultaneously make calls to other agencies um, like police, um, other fire departments, um, MCSO, DPS, and we try to provide the best service to our customers that we're able to provide. And we do this 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, just like the police department dispatchers do. I do invite you all to come down and see what we do. Uh, we have a brand new dispatch center, and it's lovely, and you, plenty of space for all of you to sit down and watch and listen to what we do. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thanks for the invitation. <coughs> Michelle Newcomb? Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council. My name is Michelle Newcomb, Chief Steward for, Avi uh, for ASME Local 2960. When I became a steward for aviation, I did not realize how low the pay was for the aviation dispatchers uh, received. The responsibilities and the multiple job duties that they perform in a shift are impressive. I'm sure I will not be able to give you all the job duties that the dispatchers perform, but I'm going to try and give you what I know. They, they have responsibility for answering airport emergency phone lines and then requesting police and medical service. They receive calls from passengers for emergency duress, stuck elevators, paging, and work orders. They monitor and respond to alarms that are generated by the airport's access control monitor system. They have procedures protocols that they have to be followed and received in incoming alarms. They view surveillance cameras and to deter, de, and determine the level of response required and then dispatch police and operate, uh, operation personnel. Also, they monitor the elevators, escalators, moving walkways, dispatch maintenance personnel as needed. Dispatchers maintain two-way radio communication with police, fire units, operation and maintenance personnel and uh, higher up the chain of command. Monitoring and dispatch services for the airport, fire alarm system, covert security alarm, security checkpoint ring down lines, aircraft emergency ring down, airport lightning detection, and the airport emergency notification. I ask that you all vote for the, uh, for the two-step increase due to, due to the increased responsibility and multiple job duties that are performed daily. Also, they are part of a team that keeps our passengers, customers, and vendors in public secure and safe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Alan Oatman. And Buddy. <laughs> uh, 
Hello, everyone. My name is Alan Ottoman. This is my son, Brody. I just won't repeat, repeat this statistics, but I've been a current dispatcher for four and a half years in the dispatch fire alarm room. Um, I'm here to offer support and hope that you guys would too. Uh, we're two steps behind PD. Um, the numbers are slightly different, but we stay um, on the phone with patients, patients' family, um, for an extended period amount of time. I currently also am a paramedic. I work in the field. Um, so we offer life-saving tips, CPR, um, different other medical procedures that we can, e we call it EMD. Um, so we stay on the phone for an extended amount of time um, until the help arrives. Um, so I got my hands full. <laughs> I just want to say, <laughs> yes, he, he's done. <laughs> so and Brody's I just also say, in favor Thank you, of the everyone, item. for your time and looking into this. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thank you for talking. Uh, Sonia Valenzuela. Good afternoon. I'm a little nervous, sorry. <laughs> we don't bite. <laughs> Um, I'm Sonia Valenzuela. I have been a Phoenix Fire Dispatcher for about 10 years now. Um, just to reiterate what my other dispatchers have said, um, we uh, would like our increase in pay um, and to be equal with PD because we do just as much as they do. Um, they deservingly get that pay and I feel that we do as well. We just do it in a different capacity. Um, we are the voices on the line that help you deliver your baby at home. We're the voices on the line that walk you um, through CPR when your child's found in the pool. Um, we don't, our call doesn't end when we get the trucks on the road. We stay on the line with you until help gets there and even afterwards to make sure that your family and your needs are, are met. We don't only take 911 calls, we take calls from um, citizens who call in for information, who call in just to talk because they're lonely, um, who call for resources that the fire department don't provide and we provide seamless service. We um, get them those resources. I will take my time to find those resources that you need. I don't just hang up the phone and say, I'm sorry, I can't help you. Um, we are very proud of what we do. Uh, we choose a thankless career. We are the voices on the phone and the radio that you don't always see. And um, I believe that uh, we deserve this and I'm respectfully asking you to vote yes. Thank you very much. Uh, I have some cards that uh, are in favor but do not wish to speak. Uh, Frank Piccoli, Deborah Novak Scott, Barry McCarran, Rebecca Westover, uh, Victoria Gomez. We'll put those all on the record that uh, you're in favor. Does anyone want to make any comments? Councilwoman? I just want to thank them for what they do as well. You guys do amazing work for the city of Phoenix. Thank you. Council Mayor. Yeah, I also want to thank every one of our dispatchers, and I appreciate what Sonia just mentioned. Our Phoenix police dispatchers deserve what they get. This is about fairness and equity, and, uh, and as someone who works with the alarm room, if, if I'm uh, at my other office, uh, you know, our, our dispatchers are actually helping to deliver children at home, walking people through some of these emergencies, trained emergency medical dispatchers, and work incredibly well under pressure. Um, you know, ask for a tour. I, I believe there's a way that the general public can get a tour. Certainly, I would ask everyone up here to get a tour. Uh, uh, but you, you would, you'd be surprised just how much goes into that particular job. And so I am, I'm excited to support this. I want to congratulate Frank Pacioli. I want to congratulate uh, all of the members of the Phoenix uh, Fire Dispatch Center. I believe 28 departments, by the way. So it's not just the city of Phoenix. We're talking about the entire valley working off of one 911 system, which is why we have such a seamless service across the valley. Uh, it's because of the women and men who are taking those phone calls, so thank you. Anyone else? Uh, I just want to say I unfortunately had the opportunity to call you, and uh, you have been 
a tremendous help to me and my family. Uh, you've taken us through some pretty perilous situations, and you have done it in such a professional and compassionate way. You are to be commended, and I think you are most deserving of all this. So thank you very much. With that, roll call. Just CCO. Yeah. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Williams. Mayor Williams. Yes. Um, seven to one. Uh, item 103. Move item 103. Give me a second. Okay. I moved, I moved we, it. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second. second. Uh, I have one card, Laura Ross. Mayor and Council, my name is Laura Ross. I'm the president of the City of Phoenix Retirees Association. I worked for the city for 30 years and retired, thankfully. Um, as an employee, I was the healthcare representative for the middle managers for about 17 years. And as a retiree, I've been that same representative for 13 years. Um, I retired as a deputy director of the Management Services Division of Street Transportation. You can see that I have a strong interest and background in healthcare issues. Um, the City of Phoenix has always provided uh, very good healthcare for the citizens. However, we did get a little glitch and have a problem when the city chose to move the retirees to a private exchange with Towers Watson just a few years ago. Uh, the biggest part of the problem was with the pre-Medicare individuals, and I am pleased to say that the city stepped up and offered an alternative for those pre-Medicare retirees to come back to the city. Um, but the city only brought back the pre uh, Medicare individuals. Um, as you all know, health care is a very expensive issue, and we as retirees pay 100% of what the cost is. And so as a part of the group that represent is, represents retirees, I'm looking for something that will offer a viable, stable way to continue to provide health care. We have been pursuing for the last few years uh, and uh, the ability to move into the state system so that we would be part of a larger group and that would help as far as rates are concerned. I just have a couple of more things. I, I very much encourage you to be supportive of what this issue is because it is a stepping stone to get us to a place where the retirees will have a stable, affordable health care option. Thank you very much. We have one other card that doesn't wish to speak. Uh, Deborah Novak Scott is in support. Uh, any comments? Roll call. I, oh, this sorry. is the one I have comments, and I would like staff to, um, regarding this. Um, So, and um, Lori, I know you weren't here. Leslie, I'm not sure if you were here in 2000, 2016. But in 2016, um, at that moment in 2016, of course, we were looking for efficiencies and effectiveness. And one of the areas that we found or tried to find efficiencies was in healthcare. And in 2016, I had date deep, deep concerns regarding going on the exchange and uh, what it would do to our retirees and the shifting of what we had promised employees if they gave their years to working for us and what the benefit was their, not only their retirement, but their health insurance. And so today, I feel like it's a deja vu of the conversation I had in 2016 
because we're here where I thought we would land in the sense of the exchange is not working for the retirees. There is a gap that we're missing people that are retired and now we're playing catch up and trying to figure out how to solve that problem. And I am just gonna be frank with my colleagues up here at the fact that when we start messing around with our health care and really looking at quality, um, we're starting to mess with the quality of our health care when we're starting to look for efficiencies. And unfortunately, at this moment, our retirees are the ones who are paying the price. So those are my, Laura, you weren't here, so my question is, why are we doing this? But I think I kind of summed it up, and you could say why we're doing this. Mayor, members of the council, uh, Vice Mayor Pastor, we are doing this because we are um, interested in offering a better option to our retirees. Ultimately, our goal, um, as Laura Ross um, articulately said, is to get to a place where we can um, work with the ASRS system and have our retirees be able to participate in that system. ASRS is not ready for that at this time because we need to provide them with adequate data to show them that our, our retiree pool mm -hmm. matches theirs a little bit better. Um, and so that is this is the bridge to hopefully get us to that point. Um, we are we are interested in offering a better option through United Healthcare to our retirees at this time um, to expand our pool, um, to increase the number of retirees enrolled in that pool, um, which we believe will provide a more balanced pool that AS ASRS will then hopefully um, in a few years accept um, into their pool and we will be able to um, offer that to our retirees as well. Okay, my question now to you is what type of pool are they looking for? I'm gonna ask Leslie Dewar, our subject matter expert on this and deputy director to speak to that. She has um, been the one who has had the majority of the conversations with ASRS um, and can provide you some more detail. Mayor Council, Councilwoman Pastor, uh, ASRS is looking for uh, the addition of the, the retiree group from the city to be demographically matched to their group. And right now, because our group has been sliced up and, and uh, has become much smaller than it was at one time, it is not uh, matching up experience-wise, utilization-wise, to the ASRS group. When you say experience-wise, what does that mean? The claims experience uh, does not match up. It, it, it is higher, it's, it's a greater, because this is a smaller group. Okay, thank you. And, and for uh, people that are uh, watching, um, people probably don't know this, uh, I started working at 14, and I guess at 14, uh, I was able to be exposed to many different areas. One area, when I returned back sh from Chicago, uh, I worked in the Department of Insurance. So I understand the insurance industry, and I understand uh, I worked there for three years, and uh, it's a re regulatory area, but it's also, you learn a lot about pools and demographics experience. And basically, uh, what insurance companies like, they like healthy pools. They like to see healthy pools in order for your insurance to uh, be reasonable and, uh, and demographically, that it's, and, and I see what ASRS is because I sat on the ASRS board and understand what we look at. And uh, all these items, basically, you hope, to get on the ASRS. ASRS is a very difficult system to get on, and ASRS looks at the impact that it's going to take of retirees from our system and what it's going to hit on their system. And they're very protective and they're very conservative. So um, I'm just saying, 
us uh, uh, to my colleagues, we have to monitor this and really see the impact that we did to our retirees. So thank you. Thank you. Councilman Waring. Thank you. Isn't the problem that the pool has shrunk because the costs for the insurance that the employees will be buying, it's not subsidized by taxpayers, correct? I mean, they have to pay the full freight. That is correct, Councilman. So in doing that, it, sometimes it becomes cost prohibitive. So if your spouse is still working or you have some other option, that's what you do. So the pool's down to 1,100 people who skew older and not as healthy. And so the state won't take us, bottom line. That is correct. It's not a question. I mean, the legislature would have to vote. And so far, they've shown no inclination to do that. Correct. We had a plan in 2016, and that plan didn't work. Right. But you got to try something because part of the problem it's not, I don't really see it as an issue of us trying to save money. It's the, it's the employees can't afford it, and there's been a longstanding commitment of the city to offer insurance to retirees, is my understanding. It's not really even a contractual thing. It's just something the city has always done. Is that a fair statement, Ed? I'd have to ask Leslie about the contractual piece. We certainly have done it. And I'm not saying we shouldn't in there's, any way. I think I'm there's probably saying. a moral contract, at least. Okay, yeah. fair enough. Yeah. So... So it's something we want to continue to do, but if the employees can't afford it, then that doesn't make sense either. The state has eight plans you can pick, and they would be cheaper than what we're offering today, right. which is not as good a plan as you might hope, and it's certainly not as good a plan as current employees get. For 18 months when you leave, you can get a COBRA, right? So you retire, you get a COBRA for 18 months, but then you hit the end of that 18 months and suddenly you're paying more, I hate to say it this way, for a crummier product. Right. Is that about what it comes down to? So, so if the people watching at home, that, that's kind of a synopsis, but we're not talking about taxpayer money. We're trying to make it an affordable product. Right. It sounds like you've got a three-year plan starting from, I guess, today? Starting from January 1st, 2019. 2019, okay. So, so I guess my fear, though, is if in three and a half years our friends at the state are still like, yeah, no, no, we're not going to take you. What are we going to do then? I mean, is there a backup plan? I know it's three and a half years, but it'll go by pretty quick. It's already been a couple years since 2016. Mayor, members of the council, we're going to need to monitor this very closely over the next couple of years um, to see how, in fact, this progresses. And if the pool increases as we anticipate it doing, um, we will have to, we will obviously know you know, incrementally how things progress um, well before three years from now um, and can continue to have these conversations uh, with the council and to advise, um, you know, what we believe is the best path forward. Um, but, but ultimately, um, decisions will have to be made along the way. And, you know, at the two-year mark, three-year mark, um, whatever is most appropriate to determine how to proceed. At this point in time, we believe this is the best option for our retirees, as you mentioned. They pay their, uh, their full premiums, and we are trying to um, provide an option that is affordable and that is a better option than what they have today. And I'm not saying, Madam Chair, your, your plan won't work. It's just, from what I remember, you were trying to go from 1,000 and change number of employees in it now to about 4,000. You're trying to quadruple it. You know, three to four thousand, uh, Councilman Waring, over the next two to three years. Um, I asked this in the hearing: Why can't you put the retirees in with the current employees, and the average cost would go up two percent? Because again, you'd be mixing a younger, you know, by and large, the actual current employees are younger, makes sense than the retirees. Correct. But I do hear what Ed is saying. At the very least, we have an obligation, certainly, to try. But it sounds like, from what he's saying, we're, we're, we're going to keep doing this. Um, it just seems at some point we're not going to be able to, and we can't force the legislature. The only way this can happen with the, with the state is if the legislature votes. They have to vote on this, right? And our history with them is a little up and down. There is a state statute that would need to be amended as a okay. first step before our retirees, the city's retirees, could join the Arizona State Retirement System's benefits plan for uh, health care. And then, of course, the ASRS administration would need to agree to it as well. Um, there is, just as an aside for uh, mayor and council's information, a health care trust board that oversees this issue as well. It is comprised of primarily citizen members and one employee. 
those citizen members come from the world of insurance and finance and healthcare primarily. And they, they too are concerned. They too worry about the sustainability. They meet every other month and this is a topic on their agenda at every meeting. Um, so I would just, I would encourage the city manager, you know, this is great they got a plan. We also had a plan a couple of years ago. I'm not poo-pooing this current plan, but maybe think about other alternatives too. I don't even know what that would be in our private meeting. I asked, it didn't sound like there was another alternative. And it does sound like just simply cutting it off, which I, I agree, I don't, I don't think would be fair. But at some point you're kind of by definition cutting it off. If this gets to be so expensive nobody can afford it, you know, are you really gonna have a pool with like 200 people in it or something? I mean, can, is that even, I'm surprised you can do it with 1,100. I was kind of shocked by that given how many employees we have right now and so forth. The fact that everybody else seems to be fleeing for some other option kind of tells us where we're at as a product. It's nobody's fault, it's just the way it is. Um, I, I don't know how you would do it you know, if there's something, because the, the benefits packages for the current employees is negotiated, it's a negotiated thing. It's not something we decide, it's not something the city manager decides, that's a negotiated thing. All those retirees, I assume, had at some point been covered by the city, right? I don't see how they wouldn't have been. Is, yeah. Does this get discussed at those meetings? Is there a way to do it so it doesn't hit the taxpayer? No. But employees might voluntarily say, well, if I'm going to be able to buy this going forward, maybe there aren't enough of them to make, have that make sense. I don't know. But, but something, I guess I'm just throwing something out there, anything that might work. Because at some point, it's, just, it's not going to be practical. And you're going to be really ruining the life, basically, of anybody who's left who we're suddenly like, we're not offering this anymore. That's just not something I'd be comfortable with. And in three years, I'll go by in a heartbeat. So. Mayor Councilman Waring, just to, to build on that and emphasize what Lori and Leslie said. So... We're gonna know along the way incrementally what our results are so we don't have to wait three years to decide, oh, what's happening. Um, the other point is this plan now with United Healthcare is a better option than what they have today. And so it in itself is an option uh, moving forward. Even if ASRS doesn't do something, this plan would, we would assume, continue to be an option that we would work with. But we are going to continue to, to work on this and report back to the council because, as you say, three years goes by, goes by fast. And so we know we've got to be on this, as uh, Vice Mayor Pastor said as well, that we've got to be monitoring this uh, every month. Well, and if it doesn't work, you've got to start planning a year and a half right. out to have right. something else in place. Yes, I, I, if I misspoke, I apologize. I know what we're voting on today is better than what we have right this second so I, I think I did when I think back on what I said that so so I understand that the state would be better still mm -hmm. yes. because then I assume the eight plans are tiered uh, I'm a retiree from the state so <laughs> I know um, there's eight there are eight plans and you can kind of pick what you need um, so if you're willing to pay more if you've got some some issue um, that needs to be addressed and then pay less if you don't or you have a smaller family or what have you um, that's certainly the best alternative, but you know, that, that seems a little bit dicey going to the legislature and basically begging, um, given that they've already, it sounds like it said flat no. To this point, it, uh, Councilman Waring, it has been a no. Mm -hmm. now, that's enough of that, but just so people understood the issue, thought that was important. And I just want to add clarity, those retirees, those are the ones in the bubble, right? I call the bubble of if I retire at 55, 55 to 65, I'm not able to get on Medicaid or Medicare. Vice those Mayor, are the ones in the bubble. Vice Mayor Pastor, you are correct. The, those that, are, that were most affected by the change right. were those in between 55 and 65. You are correct. And I just want to say, uh, wearing, um, if I was in that situation, even though I could retire, I think I would stay just for my health care. So we may see that. Thank you. Actually, you do see that a lot. Yeah, you just I don't see. know it. Exactly. <laughs> Any other comments? If not, roll call, please. DeCicio. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Mayor Williams. Yes. Uh, I think it's 8 0. Uh, Councilman Waring, would you like to make the motion since you did all the hard work? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I move uh, uh, to approve item 106. I think Second. I uh, uh, you have to read the title. Yeah, you got your motion in your second, so. <laughs> Item 106, Ordinance G 
6473, an ordinance amending Chapter 23, Article 4, Section 23-52 of the Phoenix City Code relating to prostitution, soliciting an act of prostitution and related offenses and penalties, and amending Chapter 2, Article 3, Division 1 to add Section 2-101 to establish the Human Trafficking Prevention Fund. Keep the motion. Yes. She, no, well, I mean. One saying no and one saying yes. Okay, go ahead. Repeat the Move motion. Approval. Move to approve <laughs> item 106. Second. All right. It's worth doing twice. It is worth doing twice. And thank you for all your work. I know you put a lot of time and effort for, what, two years or longer on Madam this? Chair, I, I hate to be disagreeable, but you said uh, I think all my efforts are, uh, that's, that's, grossly, grossly overstated. I want to thank Mayor Stanton for putting together our task force, and frankly, all of you guys have participated in this, uh, especially yourself, Madam Chair. I appreciate the comments, but but I don't think anybody actually took that seriously that it was all me. But I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, you know, it's certainly, uh, we've got a great committee, uh, and we're trying to make this uh, city, and frankly, the state, to the extent we can, as unpleasant for people who want to abuse, and again, a lot of times this is kids, we want to heighten those penalties and we want to make this the most unpleasant place to get caught engaging in this just horrendous activity. I just, I cannot emphasize enough how many victims we've had at our committee and it's been, it's been since I think uh, 2013. No. So December 2013, so we've been doing this a long time. Um, the stories that we hear are just awful. A lot of it again involving kids and and if you're out there and you're watching this, hopefully that's unlikely, but this is a pretty prevalent activity. If you're out there engaging in prostitution on the John side, or you're out there and you think this is cool or this is harmless because oh. Hollywood told you so or whatever, that is just a bunch of hooey. I'll tell you what, um, it is just disgusting what goes on. It's a day-to-day -day activity. It's not built generally around big sports events and so forth that may induce a little activity, but it is completely unacceptable what you're doing and you should stop. If we catch you, as, as this item indicates, we're gonna make it as unpleasant for you as we possibly can and I don't feel bad about that at all. So I know we have uh, somebody here to speak, Madam Chair, probably somebody from our committee, so I appreciate you, you Thank hearing you. that. Thank uh, you. And, and I hope if they get caught and they get in jail, they announce to the whole jail population what their offense was. It's another source of punishment. <laughs> Sean Severud. I saw no mercy for those people. Mayor, uh, interim mayor, and uh, members of council. Now, I, I do want to applaud the council in trying to address uh, the sex trafficking epidemic. Sex trafficking, excuse me. Sex trafficking epidemic. There we go. Um, Unfortunately, I do feel pretty strongly with these proposed amendments, we are moving in the wrong direction. Sex works does need to be de decriminalized. It will be eventually, years and years from now, and subsequently normalized, regulated, and taxed. We shouldn't be prosecuting purchasers of this service, just as we shouldn't be prosecuting the individuals offering this service. You may not agree with this sex work because of your moral compass, and I, I get that. Um, whether it's due to your per particular religious persuasion or otherwise. But sometimes in a civilized society, we do have to put up with things we don't necessarily agree with. For instance, here today, uh, I did see earlier, uh, they probably left, but I did see members of a particular local hate group. I don't agree with what they say uh, or what they do, uh, but I do recognize their right to be heard and to speak. We can't outlaw, all outlaw those we disagree with. Um, prostitution is a victimless crime. In fact, it shouldn't be a crime at all. Sex work is an enormous industry and it will exist no matter what. We all know that it's the oldest profession in the world. Um, we need to bring it out of the shadows. By doing so, we will make it a safe and regulated industry in which sex workers can feel safe to report crimes to the appropriate authorities and will provide visibility to law enforcement to, per, to prevent those truly heinous crimes such as sex trafficking. As I'm sure you all probably recall from previous times I've come here, I am very much progressive, but this is, some, is something I feel like those who would consider themselves fiscal conservatives 
could agree with progressives on, right? This, there's a ton of wasted money going towards prosecuting these victimless crimes. So again, I appreciate you all hearing me out. Uh, thank you very much, and we need to stop prosecuting victimless crimes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other comments? Hearing none, roll call. Oh, sorry. I would just say, so a lot of the, the folks we have met, um, who are now, by and large, adults, they were kids. Mm -hmm. 14 years old, I think that's the average age to start. When I was 14, I didn't get to pick my own job. I lived with my parents, starting, I think I was a high school freshman. Um, I, I think it's a myth to believe that people go into this because that is a conscious choice. There, there, there may be some people like that, there's always exceptions. But the people we hear from, they're not making a choice. They got sold by their parents or, I mean, I'm not the most emotional guy, but, but there was one woman, she's, you know, living a life, and she's in her 40s, but, but she told her story, and then she just, she looked at us, and she said, you know what, I was 14 years old. I think it was an aunt and uncle sold her for drugs, and she's like, these adults did all this stuff to me. She goes, they were adults? What were they thinking? I was a kid, and it was, uh, it was really hard to hear that. It's kind of shocking what people do to each other. I, I appreciate everybody's got a right to an opinion. I know that's out there too. It's victimless crime. I personally disagree. Um, I just think anybody who, who thinks that might want to come and hear some of these stories, uh, there might be others who would come and say, yep, I chose this after four years at Princeton or something. Uh, there probably are a couple people like that. I, I think that's probably a small minority of people we're talking about. I think it's mostly kids and a lot of substance abuse involved, and we're gonna to try to help them however we can, but to the adults who are abusing them, I'd, I'd make these penalties a lot tougher if I could. We were kind of confined by state law and other ordinances and so forth, but we're doing what we can. So thank you, Madam Chair, for your kind words. I really appreciate it, and, and all the work that the staff and everybody has done. Thank you. Mayor, just a quick comment. Councilman. Well, I wanna thank Jim for bringing this forward. This has been your issue, even when you were at the legislature. And you be able to, you've been able to take your leadership from there here and move you know quite a bit of issues forward the things dealing with domestic violence that you and councilwoman Kate Gallego worked on this issue here that you've worked across the lines on um, you know it's funny is that a lot of us think of us as partisans which we are you know I mean have to be blunt about that but at the end of the day when it comes to protecting the public we all work together and I think what uh, Jim Waring and Councilwoman Kate what Gallego have done together to work together especially on these types of issues has been exemplary and I think they need to be commended for the work that they put into this. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comment? Mayor, uh, what a great item to finally bring forth and, and vote on and support and I you know, I, I really appreciate uh, the effort Councilman Waring. That's, uh, you know, you, you've been committed uh, and, um, you know, to, to, to hear some of the stories from up here, third party, uh, you know, we've had some stuff and, and our, we have an amazing city staff that actually works Starfish and other things, uh, trying to, to get people back on track. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, we have to have some laws that are that are being enforced in many cases the, the, the Johns get off pretty easy and uh, and so some changes have to be made and uh, so you know I'm definitely supportive but I, I'm also very appreciative Councilman Waring has, has done so much work on this thank you uh, we have one card from James Stibler who's in favor but doesn't wish to speak uh, from my perspective I am absolutely supporting this. Anything we do to protect our children, boys and girls uh, from this type of abuse uh, has my full support. So with that, would you do roll call, please? DeCicio. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Dark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Mayor Williams. Yes. Eight to zero. Uh, our next item, I think, is 109. Item is uh, move approval of 109, and then I want to ask a question. Okay. Second. We have a motion and a second. Councilwoman, Vice Mayor. Um, regarding this contract, 
uh, it says amendment of the existing contract with Community Bridges and add, add up to 325,000 from 2018-2019 Community Development Block Grant and 225,000 in the general funds for four additional navigators. Um, it was under my impression uh, back, and this is where I need clarity, uh, that there was going to be more variety of com uh, contracts for homeless uh, outreach and engagement other than CBI. Is this not the case? Good afternoon, uh, Mayor Williams and Vice Mayor Pasteur. Uh, you are correct that we have made a commitment going forward that we would ensure that as we continue to take a look at the effectiveness of our outreach and navigation services for our homeless community that we are taking those out for a bid, if you will. Um, we bring this before you because this was two items actually, one that was voted on by the City Council back in October, I believe it was, of 2017. And so what we are simply doing with this is one thing relative to that, uh, amending the contract which we appropriately need to do based upon uh, the direction and vote that you gave to us. And then we also have in the supplemental for the budget for 1819, um, the addition of two more navigator teams and in order for us to be able to bring those online effective, effect, efficiently and effectively, uh, we are choosing to go with CBI. However, going forward, we will ensure that any other additional services, we're issuing those through a request for proposal competitive process. So the reason why this, this this contractor, it's being amended, is because uh, my, uh, what I'm interpreting is you are saying that CBI is the current contractor and you want to get four additional navigator teams up and going and that's why it's the current contract. Uh, Mayor Williams, Vice Mayor Pastor, that is correct and if I could add to that, we want to get them up and going immediately. This allows us to do that. Okay, thank you. Any other mm -hmm. councilwoman? And I think this one, we ought to give some credit to Councilwoman Stark, who ha ha has been talking with a lot of constituents about Phoenix Cares and received a lot of feedback that the original hours of operation were helpful, but that often the areas when people really need the most support were outside of those hours, such as sometimes evening interactions, including people who really just wanted to help families get to a safe bed. And so can you speak a little bit about how the ex expanded hours will impact? So uh, Mayor Williams and Councilwoman Gallego, uh, it will, it will, it extend, our hours are, are currently from 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. This allows us the ability to be able to send more teams out during those periods of time to continue to meet the need as well as it's going to allow us to provide some specific services relative to navigation. So as we've briefed the mayor and city council on different occasions, you find with individuals in our community who are homeless, it takes multiple touches and it requires really spending considerable time uh, with them to build trust in order to engage them and move them to services. So it allows us within that 5 a.m. to 11 p.m. time frame to have more availability of individuals as well as be able to dedicate some teams that are doing the continued follow-up, if you will, to develop that trust so, again, we can move more individuals into services. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? Uh, Councilman Nowakowski. Thank you, Mayor. Marcelle and staff, I really want to thank you for all your hard work, and it's a great program. Um, Community Bridges allows the city to have a tracking device, and that's something that's really important to find out where the most needs are. I know in each of our districts we have been asking for more services, more teams, and, and more help, so I just really want to thank you for all your efforts and, and the great job that stepping into this new position. You just ran with it, so thank you so much, Marshall. Okay, all right, roll call, please. DeCicio? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Norikowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Valenzuela? Yes. Waring? Yes. Mayor Williams? Yes. I think that's eight to zero. Um, I would like to move item 119 and 120 together. Okay, we have a motion and a second. I believe somebody wants to make comments. Councilman DeCicio, did you want to make a comment or? No, I was generally okay with 119, but I can vote against both if that's it. <laughs> I'm voting no on 120. <laughs> Councilman Waring? 
I'm That's why I bundled it. <laughs> All right, if you want that new underpass not to be pretty, I understand, so. Roll call. DeCicio. No. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Yes. Mayor Williams. Yes. Six to two. Okay. And then. No, go ahead. Now. Okay. I was like, okay. Uh, and then I would like items 121 and 122 to go together. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Comments? Councilman Waring? No, oh, Madam Chair, I don't know if uh, arts guys are here, but just these are not just arts features, they are safety features as well, correct? And one, mm -hmm. 121 and 122. Mayor Williams, Councilman uh, Waring, yes, indeed. These, um, both of these items include safety, safety features. Good. Thank you. Any other? Okay, seeing none. Uh, roll call, please. DeCicio. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Woo! Williams. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Eight to zero, I believe. <laughs> Mayor, I want to note that this is in my district. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that takes... I don't... Item 129, move approval. Do I have a second? Second. We have a second. Any comments? May I? Uh, Councilman Murray. So again, I don't know who's here to answer questions about this. Perfect. I thought I saw him earlier. So oh, thanks, Chief. I appreciate it. So, Madam Chair, if I may, um, so we've we've met about this. Uh, there have been some issues, some disharmony on the committee. Frankly, I've had a couple of people I've appointed quit. Um, kind of, where does this stand now? I want to make sure we're making the best decisions and the best use. And some of the feedback I've gotten hasn't always been positive. And, and you and I have talked about that. It's been a while, though, a month or more. Has has everything sort of settled down? Uh, Mayor Williams, Councilman Waring, simply stated yes. Uh, we took input from you, from other members of the council. Uh, we conducted a presentation of public safety and veterans subcommittee, and one of the big issues regarding some of those items that weren't initially recommended for funding, that was resolved, and the subcommittee is moving forward with those, specifically as it relates to funding for wake-up clubs. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm not in public safety, obviously, so... Um, so I appreciate that. Uh, it's just some of, as we've discussed, some of the feedback, not, not pertaining to you or staff or anything, um, has been a little concerning. I'll support this this year, but um, certainly going forward, I, I personally, I'm sure we all do, we'll, we'll kind of look at these items and make sure it seems like they make sense because some of the feedback's been a little, from our volunteers, you know, they're just trying to do a good job. They've got no real skin in the game other than that. I uh, just want to make sure that, that they're being taken care of. So thank you. I appreciate that update. Uh, Councilman Nowakowski and Yes, Mayor. Um, I'm trying to look it up right now. There's an item on on the Levine uh, baseball that it wasn't fully granted, and it's a it's a baseball league that was um, created out there in Levine. We don't have a um, recreational center, swimming pools, or any of that kind of YMCA boys and girls club out in that area. Um, there's three high schools out there, and um, they were asking for a block grant for for the lights, and they were given half of the grant. I was wondering if we can give the full amount of the grant, and it goes just for the um, the lights of the um, f um, baseball fields that goes to um, Caesar Chavez Park. Okay, uh, is that the grant? Of Page 135, Levine Baseball League that asked for 10,000. They approved 4120. Correct. And you want to move it to 10? Correct. Okay. Uh, Vice Mayor, did you have comments? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I have a comment. I would like to bring this back to public safety. Um, not this vote, but 
um, the process of the awards and really looking at, there was such uh, discernment this time around and me studying the list and looking at it and the reasons why. And so I would like to uh, move this, not this item, but like to have a discussion in the future in the public safety uh, area regarding this block watch. Regarding block watch, not this one. No. I was somewhat involved <laughs> in this process because I received a lot of calls and comments and uh, complaints, quite frankly. And um, I went down and observed, looked at the forms and whatever, and found not all comments uh, were not correct. Uh, I had asked for the committee to review and update their guidelines and I believe they're in the process of doing that, that need to come back to the Public Safety Committee for review and approval. And I would expect we'd probably have that, what, September? She's shaking her head yes. Okay. So, okay. yes, I absolutely agree with you. So, I, I guess uh, the motion that was made to approve this to uh, include A Councilman Nolenskow's request. Or, I'll second it. Okay. Any further comments? Councilman DeCicio? Just a quick one. Um, this is the first I've heard of it, too. But it doesn't seem logical to fund half of something when it never gets accomplished at that point. So, I mean, we ought to be looking at how we complete projects, too. I don't know enough about it. Uh, this is the first I've heard of it, so I don't know the full debate or what has occurred in there. It just doesn't seem logical. You don't do it right the first time. I mean, kids, do I always tell you do it right the first time? Always, <laughs> even if it takes a little more time and effort, even when it comes to making their beds every morning, they have to do it right the first time, right? Yep. Oh, you're a <laughs> so mean dad. So likewise, um, yeah, I'm pretty strict, but not as strict as their mom, though. <laughs> their mom's a lot more than I am. But anyways, as we look forward on some of these, you know, we ought to be looking at what's it going to take to accomplish whatever the goal is that they look forward to get again, getting and asking and what they requested for. So that's where I'll be. Thanks, Mayor. Okay. And, and just to double check, um, there's sufficient funds to cover that recommended increase, correct? Mayor Williams, yes. Okay. I can just confirm. So the, the amended motion was to go the full amount for Levine. Yes. Levine Baseball League. Right. The full 10000 right. Yes. Got it. Okay. Any other comments? Hearing none, roll call, please. DeCicio. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Yes. Mayor Williams. Yes. Item 130. Move item 130. I need a second. <laughs> okay, we have a motion okay. and a second. Uh, Leonard Clark. Um, thank you, council members uh, and Mayor, um, I have been a witness outside when fellow libertarians, other people are outside of the Maricopa County Jail, and the reason I'm asking you to vote no, and I know you won't, but on this item to fund this jail because we don't have another jail to hold our prisoners, is because uh, when I was with there with, uh, out there with these libertarians and other hum human rights people handing out uh, nutrition, water, and phone calls, I was witness to the prisoners coming out uh, in Paul Penzone's jail, former Joe Arpaio's jail, uh, female prisoners coming out seeing a pregnant lady was being denied water, uh, medication, di diabetics, uh, a man who was mentally ill begging and pleading to just have a drink of water and the guards sadistically laughing uh, as he had to drink out of the toilet. And of course not last, and I'm not sure if you actually had this on the agenda at a council meeting, it was in the media, um, the city of Phoenix agreed to have the out-of-court settlement on my fellow United States Army veteran Marty Atencio as he was the object of uh, sad, you know, sadistic torture. Uh, he was mentally ill. Some Phoenix officers unfortunately participated in that when they went over to the county jail with these sheriffs and he was tasered repeatedly, beat down, left for dead and of course now there's an out-of-court law settlement but I, I feel that this jail uh, under Paul Pinzone, I don't care if he's a Democrat or a Republican, so I'll make the Democrats mad here. Major human rights violations are continuing at this jail, 
and I know you will vote yes for the funding, but something needs to be done because our officers go over there, they're infecting, their behavior is infecting some of our officers, I believe, and the way they can treat the public. And I understand my friends out there will tell you, well, Leonard Clark, you know, he just wants to be easy on the criminals, but none of those folks have been convicted of a crime yet. Okay, so thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Roll call. DeCicio. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Yes. Mayor Williams. Yes. Uh, 133. Move, move item 133. Is there a second? Second. All right. This is an important one. This is Leonard Clark. Thank you, Mayor. My name is Leonard Clark. I uh, live right here in Phoenix. And uh, yes, I know many people, I hope you'll vote on this. I know many people will tell you, why do you care more about animals than humans? And of course, that's that black and white thinking again. No nuance, you know, Old Testament. Stone them, kill them, letter of the law. But as you know, many of my fellow veterans and many people, their only companionship in many cases is the little dog, uh, you know. If you ask people who have pit bulls, they will tell you you can't get better security than that. Um, so I believe that dogs, cats, they are sentient creatures, and they, uh, they provide comfort to many people, some people who are dying, you know, even the met pain medication won't work. So I hope that people will thank you for voting in favor of this. Um, we need to bring down all of the baby, uh, baby kittens and puppies being born into this world and suffering. You can see them running out on the streets and they do feel pain, and uh, I just believe that we need to go, we need to continue to improve, uh, help the county improve how it treats our animals, and that comes down to us, because I know that our police department is enforcing, hopefully, and the county sheriff people with the water and all of that, I try to take care of our animals, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, May I? Councilwoman. Thank you. I've had the opportunity to meet some of the animals that the police department has rescued and that the Humane Society has nursed back to health um, while in protective custody, and it's really a great success story. So thank you to our partners at the Humane Society for the great work that they do. Uh, one of their facilities is in my district, and it's just some powerful success stories. Um, our officers also really care a lot about these animals and want the best care, so a win-win today. Thank you, Councilwoman. And just a quick clarification. So this is for the Arizona Humane Society. This is not the county animal care and control. Correct. Correct. Okay, thank you. And they work very closely with, uh, you know, we have a couple animal investigators, uh, animal abuse investigators, and they have been uh, a great partner. They go out, they have it on sites, they have uh, seized animals uh, and cared for them. Um, I'm very, very supportive of this. Roll call. DeCicio. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Mayor Williams. Yes. Item 136. Um, item 136, I move approval with, uh, with the addition of working with the school district regarding uh, Wilson School District and the items of their concern. Councilwoman, did you have a comment? I did, thank you. This is a voluntary property acquisition by the city for Sky Harbor Airport. Um, this is in City Council District 8 and asked that this one be continued at a previous council meeting. Um, the airport has acquired a lot of property in the Wilson School District and it's had an impact on their operations. Um, so been talking with the city manager and I just if we wanted to share the conversation publicly we are looking for a way to reduce the impact on the school district and I'd, uh, give the city manager an opportunity to maybe comment on this or city staff if the airport would prefer. Mayor Councilman Gallego, yes, consistent uh, with that and, and I think captured in the motion that the airport will be looking for ways to um, work with the school district to minimize the impact of what happens when they buy land and it's uh, taken from the tax rolls for the Wilson School District. And so we'll be uh, working with what's possible under FAA rules and what we can do to help protect that um, school district's revenue stream. Wonderful. And then I've uh, also spoken with management about the time it takes us to get these properties leased. 
Um, we've had some property that we tell folks in the private sector is about to be ready and sometimes we miss the, our suggested timeline by, by many months and lose some great tenants and it has an impact on the constituents and residents. So if you look at some of the properties, we uh, the police department keeps me updated on calls for service and it's trespassing, liquor violations, dangerous drugs. Uh, and if we get those activated, I think they will be safer for all the community. So just in terms of metrics, we're gonna really look at revenue and, and time to market. Uh, Mayor Councilman Gallego, yes. Uh, Mr. Bennett and Ms. Mackey from Economic Development and Aviation are working together. We will um, have a report on the metrics and uh, work to speed time to market on our properties, which also will help the school district um, when we are able to, to return those properties back to private ownership. Wonderful. It's a win. And even if we can get them leased up and active, I think that is also important to yes. the community. All right. I need, I need a second. Uh, Councilman Nowakowski. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor, the Aviation um, Department wants to buy this property for $3.6 million. The property was bought for $1.8 back in 2012. I'm concerned because we haven't seen any type of plan or what's going to happen with the use of this property. And currently, we're in this master plan for the 376 acres of land surrounding the airport. And, I'm just, and I know that we hired someone to do this plan, but it seems like it's moving very slow. And I just want to make sure that if we're going to be purchasing property for almost twice the value of what it was about five, six years ago, that we have a purpose for it and that there is a, a full plan, not just um, buying property around the airport because um, we might expand in the future. Cool. Um, uh, Mayor to uh, Councilman Nowakowski, uh, as uh, Councilman has indicated, we are actually currently uh, reviewing the plans for the entire northern area as part of the Comprehensive Asset Management Plan. And in fact, there is a uh, public meeting uh, scheduled for June the 13th uh, with the community at, uh, uh, to discuss what the future plans are for that area and uh, we would be sharing those plans with the community at that meeting. Essentially, the acquisitions to the north side of the airport are for future aviation uses. As, as the council is well aware, uh, Sky Harbor is very land constrained for the size of facility that it is, and uh, that is our future uh, opportunity for aviation uses, as well as some supporting uses uh, such as uh, some in industrial and manufacturing and uh, other transit-oriented developments up there along Washington. Uh, Councilman Hussicio and then Vice Mayor. I mean, it, it seems to be falling in with some of the market, but at the end of the day, I mean, we've gotten into these discussions of cost versus what the city purchased for. I mean, it almost falls in line with the buy high, sell low philosophy I've seen here at the city of Phoenix. I mean, we should always, on any purchase moving forward, uh, at least from my end of it, I want to know what the individual purchased the property for, what year they purchased it for, and then what the city of Phoenix is going to be buying it for. A 100% increase in just a matter of five years, five and a half years. I have not seen that in the market today. Um, it just, I just haven't seen that. The other point, and I think uh, Councilman Nowakowski brings it up quite eloquently, until there's a real plan in place, why are we doing anything? Why are we purchasing anything? Until we can actually come to an agreement as to what this plan is. Is this still in line with the fourth runway that the City of Phoenix has been looking at? Not necessarily. I mean, my understanding is that this is where the fourth runway was going to go. Uh, Mayor, to uh, Councilman DeCicio, uh, there are currently no plans for a fourth runway at Sky Harbor, and uh, the uh, uh, master or the uh, comprehensive asset management plan that is under review right now uh, and, and being updated does not contemplate uh, an additional runway within the planning horizon uh, as part of that study. This land would be for aviation support services such as uh, air cargo developments, uh, aircraft maintenance facilities, other uh, flight kitchens, other support services that we are uh, out of space for. And as uh, you know, the, to Councilman Nowakowski's earlier point, 
this facility, we're very fortunate in that it does have a, a structure on it that we, uh, as soon as uh, we, if, if council approves and we complete the acquisition, we'll be working with CED to immediately uh, make it available for lease so that we can keep it in productive uh, use uh, immediately upon acquisition. But it may have follow up. The plan, you just said we're just gonna be holding a series of public meetings on whatever the plan is, correct? So, but why aren't we waiting until we finalized exactly what it is we're going to be doing and what our needs are? Uh, Mayor to Councilman DeCizio, that's, that's a great question. Uh, actually, the city has been acquiring property up in that area since the mid-90s on a voluntary basis. And with future airport development, there's really two strategies as to how you can do uh, development. Uh, one is in terms of the way the city has been pursuing, which is on a voluntary basis, where you don't actively go out and try to acquire the properties, but as people come to you, if it makes strategic uh, sense to acquire the property, then you uh, try to put it into your portfolio for future use. The other way, which uh, it usually winds up costing a lot more money and considerably more disruptive, is to put together a plan and uh, then go in and do kind of a forceful acquisition of properties in a short period of time with some kind of bonded indebtedness. And that is usually a far more expensive and uh, also a little more disruptive process for a community. And I don't think I'm advocating for an outright condemnation proposal. I think that's what you're talking about moving forward on this. All I'm saying is I think going to Councilman Nowakowski's comments, I think they're very logical to have something in place as to what it is we expect to see and where we would like to see this so that if we're looking even doing a voluntary acquisition as we've been doing since you said since the 90s, at the very least we'd have an idea of exactly where we want to go. Um, I've got concerns uh, when someone purchases it five, I mean that's just separate, I mean that's one end of it, the other end of it is, and Cal uh, Councilman Waring and I were, I mean thanks, where, thanks to Councilman Nowakowski caught this at this, uh, the $1.8 million purchase price five years ago, Councilman Waring caught another situation where the city of Phoenix was looking to acquire property that the guy acquired I think 12 months earlier, nine months earlier, and more than triple, I think it was about three times, four times the amount they were gonna sell it to the city. So it was a total flip. But again, I have no problem with capitalism. I just don't wanna pay for it sometimes if I don't have to. So my concern on this is gonna deal with the, um, and I think people have a right to make what they want. We just have a right to say yes or no to that. Um, but at the end of the day, I, it just doesn't seem right for me. Thank you, Mayor. I would just like to make a couple comments on this. Um, I can remember in the early 90s, uh, maybe even before that, I was on the council, I was on the aviation board. And I also co-chaired with Marvin Andrews uh, the development of a master plan early in the 90s. It took, what, two years? And I'm not sure we ever did get a consensus on what that plan would be. Uh, but I have always believed very strongly that Sky Harbor is the key to economic success in the state of Arizona and especially to the city of Phoenix. If we get landlocked and we have no options in the future um, because needs change, uh, airlines change, their needs uh, are, are different. I mean, now some of them are serving meals again, so you have to have different distribution points. and as well as uh, the accommodations to be able to do that. I just think it's extremely important to continue to acquire property. If you have a total plan, in my view, what happens is, is you have set a higher value. As long as it's rather opaque and they don't know for sure, um, I think you're going to get it more reasonable. But I think I met with the, the owner. Uh, he bought during the recession and uh, According to your estimates, this is a fair price on how it was valued, and I will be supporting it. Mayor, yes. may I address that too? Because Surely. I do believe in the economic engine of the city. But who out there doesn't know that we are doing this? I mean, all those individual property owners know that this is already occurring. 
So if there's a bit of inflation in value, it's already occurred. They already know this in their minds. At the very least, that the council ought to know what we expect to see out of that area. I mean, it's just to, to think we're doing this because we're sending a straw man out there to purchase it, that's just not happening. I mean, it just isn't happening. And I know some cities do this and some places do it because that's just, you know, they do that because they don't want to see an overinflated value. But this area knows this already. All I'm saying is to Councilman Nowakowski's point, we ought to have a better idea of what we're acquiring the property for. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor, just last comment. My concern is that we bought out four neighborhoods, four Hispanic neighborhoods, and it's 120 acres of land that's still sitting out there, and we really don't have a master plan. We're still working one for that community. I just want to make sure if we're going to buy something, and especially it seems like we just doubled the price, uh, $1.8 million times two equals one, um, 3.6. It doesn't seem like there was any type of negotiation. You just doubled the price of what that person bought. The property I mean I was just doing the I was just adding it up right now and I don't think there was that much negotiation I believe that we don't have a master plan that what we're going to be doing with the property and over the last six months I've been hearing families from the um, west part of the airport that whole Sacred Heart Browns um, Sacred Heart Browns um, Browns um, issues of how we went in there, we disrupted three, four neighborhoods, and we still don't have anything to replace it. We're barely, after 33 years, talking about a partnership between CPLC, the Sacred Heart Church, and the diocese all working together. So I just want to make sure that 33 years from now, we're, we're not in the same situation with this piece of property that we double paid the price for. Uh, Mayor to uh, Councilman uh, Nowakowski, uh, when uh, aviation acquires property on, you know, on a voluntary basis, uh, we are uh, bound by complying with our federal uh, guidelines on property acquisitions that somewhat limits uh, our ability to negotiate uh, on, on the values. We, we have some guidelines on the appraisal process and then we have to uh, make sure that uh, once the just compensation has been established, that when we acquire that property, that uh, it not be uh, less than what is considered the just compensation. And in terms of the appreciation on the value, uh, perhaps uh, the appraiser's office could, could address your concerns on, on the appreciation. Mayor, City Council, uh, Jamie Spear, Real Estate. Uh, the property was purchased in 2012. At that time, the property had sat vacant for two years, so we considered it a distressed sell when you're comparing it to other properties that have sold at that time. After the property was purchased by the current owner, improvements were made. On top of that, uh, running a CoStar report shows that properties in the area had appreciated 40%. So that is consistent with our current appraisal we have. Any appraisals that are six to 12 months old, uh, we consider updating those for current data value. Mayor, my concern is we just proved uh, no, le no less than $423 for a piece of property that we own, aviation owns, right off of 24th Street in Washington, which is just blocks away from this piece of property and I'm not sure why there's such a difference in, in the value of that piece of property versus this piece of property. And I understand that there's a historic building on there and we're talking about a warehouse that we're gonna probably have to demo in the future anyway. So I mean, there's, I mean, it doesn't really add up. I mean, just as a lay person sitting here and not knowing that much about real estate, but two blocks down the street, um, it's for 423 that we're selling, and now we're turning around and buying um, property for um, 3.6 million. It's kind of confusing. Vice Mayor? Oh, I thought they were gonna answer, and oh. then I would. So uh, each property is unique, and uh, as far as like the, the bank building, the commercial building, uh, the property we're acquiring is an industrial building, so they would not be compared when doing an appraisal. 
uh, each appraisal takes a lot of work, obviously. You know, we pull comparables, we um, consider the differences to the subject property. Uh, the appraiser used six comparables in his appraisal. I've also evaluated eight independent of that, which I'll support the value. I, I, as far as comparing it to the, the other property, it would not be comparable because it's not the same type of property. What was the appraisal value of the, of the current property we're speaking of? 3620000 Three million six hundred eight thousand. <laughs> okay, and we are purchasing it, I believe, for I don't, I'm looking the same at amount. It. Okay, thank you, Councilman Dalatzman. I, I thank you, Mayor. I just w would like to first just mention that I am supportive of this item, uh, and with all due respect, I, I think everyone is doing the best they they can. We all do the best we can with these positions. But uh, I think we can pick any one of the 223 items in, in this packet today that we're voting on. And I guess the, the, the layperson may not understand exactly uh, why. It, and that's why we have subject matter experts or not realtors. We, you know, I, I, under, I know that Director Bennett has vetted this through, has put a lot of work into it. I think of two blocks over, I, I, we love our neighborhood, the neighborhood we live in. I don't know if I could afford to live two blocks over from my, my particular neighborhood, right? So, so things are a little bit different. It's not apples to apples. There's a lot that goes into it. Uh, I know that my, my team, Lisa, is here, my chief of staff, who's done, been doing a great job as well. I, uh, I chair the Downtown Aviation Economy Innovation Subcommittee, and uh, and I am going to support this item. Thank you. Uh, hearing no further questions, roll call. DeCicio. No. Gallego. No. Nowakowski. No. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Um, yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Mayor Williams. Yes. Four, four. Is it four four? Four there it fails. Okay, we will go to item one forty one. One thirty seven. Oh one thirty seven, I'm sorry. Oh. The new uh, magic you... number is four. It's no longer five. <laughs> I know, the magic number is four. Uh, item one thirty seven move uh, make a motion for one thirty seven. I have questions on this. Second. Uh, my question uh, on this was, uh, wasn't there a past contract very similar to this nature that was passed for the same type of services recently? Uh, Mayor, to uh, uh, Councilwoman Pastor, the, uh, the recent contract that I think you are referring to is for a financial advisor that works with the city's finance department and aviation on our bond issues. And uh, also with uh, other financial transactions. This is the airport consultant, council, uh, airport consultant contract that uh, advises us and works with us as we negotiate or we go through our annual or biannual airline rates and charges uh, calculations and then also studies the feasibility of various capital programs that we may have a need for and whether or not they think that those are feasible given our market demographics and, and forecast for future growth. Okay, so what I'm understanding or how I'm interpreting it is that this is a consultant that's, <laughs> I'm gonna get a section of it, that's gonna see if it's feasible for bonding and see if projects can go forward and if it's in that world of, of we have the ability to do that. And uh, to uh, Mayor, to uh, uh, Councilwoman Pastor, yes, in fact, uh, one of the more uh, important documents that this consultant prepares is what is referred to as the report of the airport consultant, which analyzes everything about the metropolitan Phoenix area, the airport and air service environment to determine the, the feasibility of any program that we may be proposing and whether or not it, it is a feasible endeavor. 
So I'm going to give you an example. Uh, we put an RFP out for uh, uh, on 24th Street regarding uh, parking, uh, possibly a hotel, all of that. We have nothing to do with it, so that went out as an RFP and somebody could bid on it. However, um, there are items within the airport that we own and that we would look at possibly a refinancing or bonding once again uh, to for um, savings or efficiency. Expanding. Expanding. Like if we were to expand a, a, an extra lane or something. Mayor, to... Uh to the uh, councilwoman, uh, that that would be the financial advisor that we were talking okay. about previously. So what would this piece be then? Because I'm getting confused now. <laughs> well, for instance, on the uh, on the uh, so give me an example. Uh, an example on the SkyTrain that is currently underway, as well as the Terminal Three modification okay. and the proposed concourse for Southwest Airlines. They do a, uh, an analysis of our market, our passenger activity, the forecasted growth of the airlines. They come back to us and tell us what the potential impacts are on uh, airline rates and charges going forward to make sure that we can afford this, stay competitive in the market. They prepare a report on the economic health of the Phoenix metropolitan area, expected growth in the economy here, and then they package that up into a feasibility report that then the financial advisor can use to determine a bond structure that might, in fact, uh, allow us to move forward with the program. So we need two different type of uh, consulting services is what I'm hearing. We need a financial and then we need a feasibility study, that, basically. That, that is, is what correct. I'm uh, two, two separate portfolios of responsibilities. Okay, thank you. Hearing no other questions, roll call. DeCicio? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Valenzuela? Yes. Waring? Ma Mayor Williams? Yes. I believe we're now to 141. Uh, move approval of 141. Second. We have a motion and a second. I, question? Okay. I have one question yes, on this one. I pulled this one. Um, on this one, uh, could you please explain to me what exactly the needs are for the services and how was the scope and contract amount determined? Um, Mayor to uh, Councilwoman Pastor, yes, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, so this is a, uh, the program management consultant is actually a staff augmentation program and they provide various uh, skill sets that uh, we do not have to help us administer our $2 billion capital investment program that we have underway. So they do cost estimating, they are construction inspectors, uh, they are quality control experts, they uh, review payments that uh, contractors submit to make sure they comply with contract documents and specifications. And then uh, importantly in this agreement, or they also uh, have the ability to bring in certain skill sets for short periods of time. And so airports, uh, and Phoenix has been doing this for a long, long, long time, having a program management contractor. You do this in order to uh, keep from staffing up when you have a major program such as we have underway today. And then when that program's over, you're looking to decide what to do with all of these uh, staff. So the, you therefore contract that service out to these experts. And so the scope is essentially the same scope that has been in place for uh, many, many, many years in terms of the, the uh, services that they provide. So there's, there's not really a change in the scope. It's just that the program, the current program management contracts are expiring at the end of June and we needed a new firm to, to replace them. Okay, thank you. Okay. Hearing no other questions, roll call. DeCicio? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Valenzuela? Yes. Waring? Yes. Williams? Yes. I believe that's 8 0. So if my colleagues uh, wouldn't mind, I would like to.
put 143, 144, and 145 together if anybody has any issues. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second on 143, 44, and 45. No comments? Okay. I think uh, congratulations to Sky Harbor. It's wonderful news with it. Uh, we shared yesterday about Condor extending their commitment to provide nonstop direct service between Phoenix and continental Europe. We've had a lot of great wins on international air service expansion, so my congratulations to the team at Sky Harbor. Jim, what uh, is the average amount of an international route to Sky Harbor do we gain in the economy in this area? Uh, Mayor, to, uh, uh, in response to your question, uh, as the average uh, expenditure of an international visitor on a daily basis on one of these flights, or it, when they visit Phoenix, is about $1,500 to $2,000 per visitor. And it accounts to, I believe it's about $3 billion is about the total of international uh, economic impact of the international routes over a year at Sky Harbor. And I've heard, uh, I, depending on what the route is, anywhere from 100 to 100 or 200 million dollars per route, uh, it can add to our economy. Uh, I, I guess I have been very supportive on the incentive program. If we want them to come, uh, actually our program is not as lucrative to airlines as many of our competitive cities are. Uh, I commend you for negotiating uh, the agreement you have. You have not given free, uh, but you have given some uh, incentives to come here, especially helping with advertising and promoting the new route. So I'm very supportive of this. Thank you. Roll call. DeCicio. No. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Yes. Mayor Williams. Yes, six to two, I believe. Okay, we are now to 154. Item move, item 154. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. We have a card, James Dibler. We have two minutes. Hello, I am James Dibler. I live in Phoenix, Arizona. I would like to see the city of Phoenix to fix cracked sidewalks because there is a lot of people getting injured every day when they walk around within the city of Phoenix. And two months ago, I got injured on a public sidewalk at 7th Street in Missouri near the Walgreens. And last month, I had surgery on my elbow to put six clues and one plate on me. But my recovery is doing good. And I would like to encourage Phoenix residents to report cracked sidewalks to avoid injuries to make sure the sidewalks is safe. Thanks for the time and consideration. Thank you. Glad you're doing well, James. Do we have a? I move approval of 154. Okay. And we have a motion and a second. Any further comments? Um, Mayor. Councilman DeCicio. Yeah, I'm going to be voting against this. I mean, this is putting, this is spending almost literally uh, just 84 cents off of spending $350,000 to put together a manual. This is what I would consider to be a head scratcher. Uh, this is something the City of Phoenix has in the past has put together themselves. Now they're going to be spending $350,000 of your money on putting together a manual. Uh, it just, I, I think Kimberly Horn's a great company. I think they're fantastic. But at the same time, I just don't, I just, this is what I would consider to be a head scratcher and, and I just put this in the line of government waste. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I, I think I'm probably the one that has really uh, been adamant that we needed to do this when I realized the fact that we had uh, plans, complete street plan, a bike master plan, a plan Phoenix plan, a walkable urban code, a downtown code, a tree and shade master plan, a downtown Phoenix comprehensive transportation plan, 
and a reinvent Phoenix plan that had not been coordinated by staff. It was done by separate citizen committees. And I said, please stop, because until we know if those plans are compatible, what the cost is for those plans, I think we need to consolidate it in some fashion, at least overlay them and see what we have, and to make sure that they are flexible enough that they apply to all areas of the city and not uh, just to a small area. So I'm one that has really pushed for this. I just wanted you to know that's all. That's the reason why. I just think when you, sp I don't want to have to put in a street and tear it out because it doesn't work. And I, I know where you're coming from, but I do not like the way this all happened without coordination. Uh, and Mayor, may I respond? I agree, this, they should all be coordinated, but these are the, everything that you've talked about are all written plans, they're already in place. It's meshing all those plans together should not be $350,000. I, I just, it's, it's just not logical to me to put, you have, I think you outlined, I think, five or six or seven plans that the City of Phoenix has currently. To be able to put those together, this is something that staff has done and can do, and there's just no reason to spend this much money on meshing a plan. I, it, I mean, they're not even starting from scratch. What they're doing is they're creating a document based off of plans that are already written. It's just not logical to me, Mayor. I appreciate no one wants to see a street ripped up, at all, but the logic here is illogical. Um, I have a question um, regarding this uh, 350, and I voted on it, so I was just uh, in a subcommittee. My question is: We don't have the capacity of doing this within our within our scope within our employees. Because I feel like e everybody was working in a very silo fashion and everybody was then running off and doing or, or having community uh, input or community committee meetings, writing all these plans and then nobody was there to coordinate all the plans and, and, and basically overlapping and, and, and uh, having a manual regarding it. I one of my problems with this is they were acting independently, right. brought to us uh, one at a time, and we had no idea as a council all of this was occurring. Mayor, um, Councilwoman Pastor, um, the answer is we do not have the staff available to be able to do the plans um, ourselves. However, um, what we do need to do on this is make sure that we're doing a very tight coordination on this. Um, and overseeing and managing that contract well. Um, what this contractor will do, consultant will do, is um, comb through the plants, as the mayor said, um, and looking for any of those conflicts um, between the variety of plans that the mayor mentioned, um, and then identify those conflicts for us. They will also be working with our staff on uh, a technical advisory team will, that will include a variety of stakeholders um, from the development community, the architect community, um, as well as our major stakeholders um, and internal city departments to make sure that all of that comes up cohesively. And then when there are conflicts, it goes through that group first so that we can make a recommendation back to mayor and council. Um, for a final decision. We're also recommending that this uh, manual, unlike the one done 10 years ago, um, be very visual, um, very um, easily accessible and readable to our consultants and contractors doing work in the city of Phoenix, um, and then ultimately approved by mayor and council at the end of the, um, the, the work that's being, once it's completed. Oh, just as a follow-up then, so what I heard in bureaucratic lingo is that we have not been looking at all the plans and making sure that they were all compatible when someone came in with a project. Mm -hmm. Is that what, how it's been done in the past? Uh, Mayor, if so, go ahead. I'm sorry, Mayor, Councilman DeCicio, um, 
you know, they do look at each one of them to make sure, um, but when you have multiples, um, you know, we, we, are, You're we are concerned that there are gaps between the plans, and that is one of the intents is to go through each one of them, um, and from this time forward to make sure that they are all in compliance. Well, again, one, you know, there's multiple areas of where this could go. <laughs> one, the city of Phoenix is just literally admitting it's not doing it right when it comes to the street projects. They've been, not been doing it right, but it sounds to me like it's a very simple thing to be able to look at the different plans. I mean, that's just what you do. And to be able to compile those plans, put them together. I, it, we, the city of Phoenix did them 10 years ago. They can do them now. I'm just hearing that they may not want to do this. I mean, and that's what I hear. I mean, I just, I would say, this is something you guys can do. It's just not logical to spend three hundred fifty thousand dollars on Council. something that should be meshed. Councilwoman Stark, isn't a lot of this to also look at the detail of the street itself and how we design it? Given that we have um, new technology, we have different bigger vehicles. We have to look at lane widths. We have to look at sharing the road with bicycles and how to make it safer. We have to look at the sidewalk and the width of the sidewalk for pedestrian activity. One of the things we've also looked at is additional shade because of the, the city we live in. We, our battle cry is more shade. And so some of the things we're going to look at, my understanding, is to look at those kind of details and how to integrate it in the right of way that we ask for from the development community. How do we make 55 feet of roadway dedication work? So is that part of it as well? Mayor, Councilwoman Stark, that is part of it, um, is uh, making sure that all of that is easily accessible back to the developers, the private development community who does the vast majority of the work, um, and making sure that they have a, an easily accessible manual to go back to to get that information. I also think there's been some change in the American Disabilities Act and looking at some of the ways we design our sidewalks and our curbs, and so I think this gives us an opportunity to look at that, too, to make sure that we are in compliance with uh, federal law. Vice Mayor? I have a question regarding your statement. What do they do now? I mean, because the statement was, this will be a manual that they can go to to know what they are to do. So what do they do now? And, and, and I don't, hang on, Mark. My second question is, we're updating this. What was the cost 10 years ago? And who did it? To uh, uh, Mayor and uh, Vice Mayor Pastor, the, um, the, the document done in 2009 was done internally. Uh, there was a stakeholder group, a TAC group, um, of what I, when I spoke with staff, um, I wasn't in streets then, but um, in discussion with them, there was a TAC group that had a series of other consultants and stakeholders that provided input. Um, to, to go along with uh, Councilwoman Stark's comment, we are a, a changing city with other modes of transportation now. We are looking at our streets to see how we can make them more effective uh, within the confines of our pavement. So the, this document, this user-friendly manual will help us in our daily decision making in providing a more effective use of our right-of-way. It still doesn't answer the question that she asked, what do you do now? I mean, right how now, we, now we, use, we use this document, but we also look at our other uh, national uh, best practices uh, to provide guidance. We also conform with our walkable urban code and others and, and work with our planning and development department on items outside of the right of way. And just as a follow-up, what, what don't you do that this document will help you do? I, th I think what they do now is they have a 10-year-old document that was done before the plans that the uh, mayor read off. And so I don't think it's the staff doesn't want to do it. If, if staff does it, it will, be sl it will take us longer because we have to pull people from doing things we're doing now to do it. It won't be as user-friendly probably because we don't have the expertise in doing these manuals. Um, so it will take us longer. It won't be as useful probably. So I think that's, that's the, the trade-off for the Again, question. it goes into what don't you do now that this manual will help you do? 
if I may jump in, uh, Mayor, Councilman Nicicio. So as, as Mr. Zerker pointed out, this is a, a 10 year old document uh, that we're working on that provides essentially the design guidelines for, for all the city streets. And you know, the, looking at all how, how all of the plans that the city has, which uh, currently the city has to go to different documents to seek the direction on the specific design guidelines that are in play. So that's, that's how that essentially is being done now. This is going to bring all of that in. So in a lot of cases, what we're talking about is plans that are aspirational, and this is actually the detailed design guidelines that help actually implement the direction that's in those plans. But as, count, as uh, the mayor pointed out, Mayor Williams, it's essential that as we incorporate this and update this document, that we take a look at all of those plans which are developed over many years uh, from, from different departments. Uh, and so even though you know, we do our best to coordinate, uh, it, it, sometimes the plans can come across and, and say different things, or we just need to make sure that we, we identify any potential areas where potential conflict exists or we need to refine the direction. And so that's what we want to do. We want to identify those areas and bring those areas forward as we go about updating these design guidelines for the streets that are intended to help all of the development uh, contractors and so forth that are actually building those streets. So again, I'm asking the questions, what specific things don't we do right now that this manual is going to help us do? Mayor. And don't we already provide detailed design drawings when the streets are done? Or not done, but in the planning stages? Isn't that already done? Mayor. Uh, but what don't we do but that Mayor this is going to help us Council do? Councilman DeCicio, to hopefully answer your question, there are a number of instances now um, within the city where uh, that show the changing environment. Along the Grand Canal, which we are implementing a project now, we are in need of, of um, providing details on connections that cross major arterials. Well, there are various ways to handle that, and we would be able to provide details and uh, specific information in design guidelines when we look to other canal crossings to implement the same type of feature. In addition, we would also look at, um, the emphasis would be on safety. We, we've seen that at the forefront right now, and that would be um, also a very important part of this document. So we don't have any mechanism in place to look at what other people do and to mesh these plans together and there's no way of providing safety? Is that what you're telling me we don't do that right now? Because that was my question, what we don't do. Uh, we, we do right now, but there are also other best practices throughout the United States that could be looked at that could be in, in, integrated into um, our way of doing things. But that's not what this plan's doing. Pardon me? That's not what this, uh, this book, this manual's doing. It's only part of it, but most of it is just meshing plans that we already have in place. Um. Uh, Mayor, Councilman DeCicio, um, actually this plan is going to combine all of those. Um, so it is, it's going to look at best practices nationwide, um, the things, the plans that we don't currently have, as Mark mentioned, for design um, mechanisms like uh, canals, where we're the only one, only city that has a lot of canals, and that's not a national standard. It's also then looking at all of the rest of the plans that have been put together, and as well as the street um, classification map. So it's looking at all of the variety of them to make it very clear um, for our contractors to go to one place. And, and Councilman, you mentioned, so how are they doing it today? So when they want to build something, sometimes they have to look in five different places to get that information or more than that. And it may not be complete. And so what we want to do is, one, we want to make our private development um, be more cost effective in um, putting together their plans by um, having one place where they can go to um, to gather the information on what our guidelines would be uh, so that they can be more effective in putting together their plans and get them approved by the city of Phoenix. It's your Councilman DeCicio, I will tell you, yeah. there is, if you put all of the plans together downtown, you can't have cars. If you put all those plans together the way they are today, the way they're written, you won't have any cars downtown. 
And that does not make our businesses, it doesn't make people who live uh, without public transportation very happy, but that's what's occurred in the last three or four years. That's what's happened. I, I can, yeah. Councilman, or Councilwoman Stark, and then I'll come back to. Yeah, I, I think that we need to look at some new, new ways of thinking. I think this design manual will help us. For example, a lot of our local streets are 50 feet wide, and they're raceways, and they're just not safe for the neighborhoods. And so through some of our committee work, we've talked about looking at like a 45 foot wide street and how do we park, have the on-site parking, how do we slow down the traffic so the kids that are playing in the neighborhood are safe. I mean, almost every local street I drive by now, you see those little signs that say, don't speed in my neighborhood, children at play. So I think we have to rethink the way we look at designs of our streets. We also are in an age of Lyft and Uber, and so maybe we don't need as much parking. Maybe we need to look at a way to design our right-of-ways to drop off people. I know, you know, my kids being millennials, they, they really do rely on, on Uber and Lyft. This is a new way of thinking. So I think this gives us an opportunity to look at the way we design our streets given the change in technology and the change of lifestyle. I think it's a, a good opportunity and I think this manual can help us. And I think it really is gonna help having the development community in there because I would like to hear what the home builders have to say about going to a 45 or 40 foot street. I think we really should. I, I mean, every I, I live on a narrow street, I live on a private street, it's very narrow and people drive very slowly, it's very safe. There's a calming feature when people are in my neighborhood. And I think we have to look at that. I think this is an opportunity. And a lot of those studies have talked about it, but they're all talking differently. And so if we can bring them together and really design a manual that the development community can work upon, I think it's a great thing. I, I, I think this is a great idea. Oh. Oh. Thank you. I actually appreciate the comments that Councilman Stark just mentioned. I think this is about evolving. We have all of these plans. It's, not a ju it's just not meshing them together. Yes, that's part of it. But moving forward, how do we manage all of these plans? If you talk to our constituency who comes out to, uh, to any of the planning exercises we have, whether it's 19 North or what we're going to do with this park or uh, yeah, the, the general plan, We've all heard it. We all have a few constituents in every district that is wondering if we're just going to put that in a book, put it on a shelf, and allow it to collect dust, and you know we're going to get it down. And this gives us a chance to evolve, to move a little quicker, perhaps at the speed of, of business or the private sector, closer to that. And what was described here is actually, I think, a, a private sector way of thinking. You know, you think of all of our partners down here in downtown Phoenix, they're evolving, they're using technology, they're, uh, and so we, we've asked our city staff to come up with a way to do this. Yes, it's, uh, you know, it's not free. It's the fifth largest city in the country. More than 500 square miles, nearly 1.7 million people who live in this city, and we're still growing. We're still 50 years or more younger than any major city out there, or most major cities out there. So as we continue to grow and evolve, we really should uh, have a system like this where we can uh, maximize our, uh, our potential or help maximize our potential. So uh, now our city staff are hearing our subject matter experts tell us that, that we don't have, the city manager just mentioned, we don't have the expertise for this, so we're going to go out, and, which is very much what the private sector would do. If there's a software that they need, they're not gonna go to their IT group and say, figure it out. If they don't have it, they're gonna go and they're gonna contract out and figure out who, who, who's gonna uh, be able to, to figure that out for, uh, for them and to develop that for them. And so this is a, an opportunity for the city of Phoenix to, to do just that. So um, I'm supportive. Councilman Murray. Uh, one thing this discussion has, has made me appreciate is why I vote no so much. So <laughs> I, 
this hasn't been well thought out. If it's true that if you put all the plans together, you can't drive cars in downtown Phoenix, I don't know, maybe you got too many plans. Maybe you didn't think it all through. Maybe it's too hodgepodge. Somebody had a good idea, so let's do a committee, throw something together. Most impressive thing in anything I've heard is that Councilwoman Limit Williams, Councilwoman, sorry, Mayor <laughs> Williams, uh, that Mayor Williams could actually remember, apparently without a list in front of her, the actual <laughs> names of all those committees and read them off. And they say experience doesn't matter. It shows what they know. But, but I gotta tell you, um, it sounds like we're not even following the old rules that we've theoretically voted on, that this has all been kind of just thrown together. We're ignoring some and accepting others. I can tell you, what was I, just a few days ago, I got lit up for the city, I think it was on Missouri, which isn't in my district. They were complaining, I think, about sidewalks that got put in. They didn't want sidewalks, but now they've got sidewalks because that's part of the complete street plan. I think that was the basic gist of it. The street needs in my area are a lot different than downtown. And again, I, I hear about all the bike lanes and everything we do downtown, and that is fantastic until you consider that 1% of the people live downtown and 555 people live and work downtown. Who are you building all these lanes for? That doesn't make any sense at all. A lot of these plans, we go through it, it's probably a bunch of nonsense. I don't know that we should pay 350 bucks, or 350 bucks, 350,000 or whatever it is for the privilege of doing that. Mayor Williams is extremely well-intentioned in trying to coordinate all this, but maybe we as a group should revisit all these plans and get rid of a few of them before we spend 350 grand. That, that, that's a lot cheaper than the money that's being outlaid here and do it ourselves and get rid of a few of the things or see if we really feel like we need them and then come up with a comprehensive plan. But the word comprehensive scares me because what happens is you're building bike lanes mm -hmm. in outer areas where nobody's ever gonna ride a bike. Um, it doesn't make any sense what we're doing. Um, I, I assume this thing will probably pass. I understand it may be, it may be necessary now in light of this fiasco which really anybody who listened to this would be like, I, I can't, fifth biggest city, I can't believe these guys are even talking like this. This is crazy. Is it really true that we couldn't drive cars downtown? That's not my, I'm just parroting what I heard. How could that even happen? How, did, how was that allowed to happen? Where was the briefing from staff when these things were put before us that said, by the way, if you do this, it conflicts with that, and then you won't be able to drive a car downtown. Seems like that should have come up at some point. That's what we have all these staffers for. So, I mean, at some point, I, I would say maybe we should table this, send to the Transportation Committee. They should come present. Here's what each plan does. What do you want to keep and what do you want to get rid of? And then see what's left and make that the plan. Scrap the rest of the stuff that apparently isn't being followed. That would be my druthers, but that's too long for a substitute motion, so I'll skip that part and I'll stop talking Thanks. now to make you all happy. But do as you will, I'm voting no. Thank no. you. No, and I understand what you're saying. I, I mean, I, I will say, I may have exaggerated a little bit. One or two cars will get through downtown. But uh, I will tell you, I know. But it's close. And it is, it went through the transportation subcommittee over two or three, four year period, these different plans. And it didn't really dawn on me, and I'm sure the other members of the committee, that what had happened, that these were developed in silence, in, yeah, silence and individually without coordination. And what I have learned since then, because Maria, you were in my office this morning talking about the bicycle lanes. Right. and they're being installed according to the bicycle plan. Mm -hmm. Does that meet with the rest of what we were talking about? Do you, have you evaluated? Do you need the sidewalks? Do you have to make more uh, ADA compliance in there? Because anything I hate is going back over and over and making spend more money on different improvements when if we do it all at once and we knew what we were doing, we would save money in the long run and a lot of public aggravation. And I see this and I hear this all the time. Uh, I know when you and I got the 
to go down and watch the traffic in downtown when there was a baseball game going and Justin, whatever his name is, was in concert. Uh, it was a zoo down there. And just as we talked about, it was cars, it was train, it was Uber, it was Lyft. Uh, it was thousands of people crossing the street uh, at the same time. And it, I can't see how businesses can strive for prosperity in those continued conditions when we haven't implemented all those plans yet. And when you throw in light rail in the middle of this, which I didn't mention, what is included, uh, I, I know I've talked to some of the businesses, I've talked to uh, the home builders and other organizations, as well as I've talked to some neighborhoods who have said, oh, don't you dare put those lights on my street, and no, I don't want a sidewalk. And I just wanted to make sure that we are coordinated and there's flexibility in there to address the needs of all the different communities within our city. We are very unique by the versatility and the diversity that we have within our boundaries. And I think that's what makes Phoenix special. And I know that you have limited staff and different, you have different departments within your department who were involved on those plans. Uh, I feel strongly that we need an outside person without any bias of being part of those committees to look at them, evaluate them, and consolidate them. So I am supporting this. Uh, Mayor, oh, I, sorry. Vice Mayor first, and then. I have a question. So it sounds like uh, really what we, we really need somebody, an outside eye to come in um, to really uh, look at, at a, uh, a big uh, outside view as to really is this possible with all these different plans. And I hear you on the bike lanes because as right now, I'm in the middle of the bike lane and trying to figure out, is this really gonna be conducive? We're, do, we're in the middle of a plan and they're putting bike lanes in here. Can we, can we hold off until we have a, a plan and, and look like if it's really gonna move the traffic that needs to be moved? Uh, the other piece that I feel like is very important is the fact that we are putting a lot of multifamily in our core uh, not just in downtown, but it's going up the core and along the light rail. And we're talking about uh, moving air lanes into uh, areas to one lane. At that moment, what's the gridlock going to look like? Uh, I think these are bit critical questions to ask an outsider to say, look at this in, the, in, a, in a big, a larger scope. What I want to know is in this process, are we, because we talk about becoming a smart city, are we also looking at becoming a smart city with our, single, our signals, our timing, all of that, so that as we're evolving, we're also modernizing and knowing what the cost is gonna be? So that's a question to you. Statement and question. Mayor and, and Vice Mayor Pastor, the, the Streets Transportation Department is always looking to, to do more in terms of intelligent transportation and, and using technology to enhance our, our traffic signal systems, um, to, to better move our traffic throughout the city and make sure that that's a part of all that we're doing. This work that, um, that we're uh, seeking to do through this effort isn't it, it recognizes the use of technology, but it's not, um, it's not a technology uh, component. This is a, a consultant that's going to come in and update our design guidelines, but recognizing that intelligent transportation systems are going to be part of that effort. So, so this is not about a smart city, but, but the issue of smart city in our signals and, and uh, street transportation department ex is we're working on that. It's, it's, this this manual is not going to address it, but it's something that we uh, are con we we do have so, as a as a filter for what we're doing. Here's my concern now. <laughs> you know where I'm going. My concern is, and now we have this manual, and then now you're telling me, okay, there's this other manual or there's other piece that we're looking at at Smart City. To me, this is a global. It's a holistic way of how we're going to map out and plan our city. And so I'm being challenged by this at this moment because 
as a person that's a visual person and likes a map and likes to know where she's going and likes a strategic plan, this is what we need. And so I'm struggling in the response, I guess. This is a manual, as I understand it, this is a manual for developers and, and, and designers. The smart city aspect would be what the street department is doing when, with its own signal hardware and equipment. So, so what you're describing is the manual is, for, is visual. That's, that's part of it, to make it a visual, accessible thing. Can I go ahead? I, I think Councilman Nowakowski's next. In the Thank you, Mayor. And Mayor, I, I understand where you're going. What I'm confused about is that I believe that we're the policymakers, and we should be telling the developers and, the, and individuals building out there what the policies are. The same situation happened with Avenida Broadway. Uh, we spent $55 million. We were tearing up the streets three, four times. Individuals were coming up to us saying, don't you all communicate with each other? At that time, um, the city manager was um, David Cavazos, and he decided to actually have monthly meetings with every single department that had anything to do with um, the Avenida Broadway. And basically, for those monthly meetings, it turned out to be every other month, then it became quarterly meetings, and we saved a lot of money, and we started to communicate with each other. I think there's a cultural, institutional culture that we have here that we don't communicate with each other. I mean, with our IT, same situation. We had to bring staff together to actually communicate with each other about just the IT needs of, of this building. And I believe that this is more of an issue for like a work study. I hear where you're coming from. I know what you wanna do with this, but I think there's deeper concerns than just coming up with a manual for developers or for individuals that wanna build in the city of Phoenix I think we really need to sit down and just with the time that we're taking here, there's a need to do those um, work studies that I know that you've been talking about bringing back. And I think this is a fine example. And if we don't have those expertise in the departments as department heads, then we should have that. We're the fifth largest city, shame on us, right? So I think that's one of the things that we really need to um, make sure that we are the policymakers make sure that we make, have people understand what the policies are, and we just don't create plans and, and codes just because a, a group comes in and advocates for that. We should make sure that it's the best practice, the best needs for our city, and I think that's the type of leadership uh, I think you're bringing to the council, and I think that there's a lack of communication throughout the whole city and bringing those departments together. And I think you're the right person to try to do that, but I can't vote on this. I would like to take some time and really make sure that there's some type of communication plan within the departments to make sure it's not just the light rail situation that we have in South Phoenix. I mean, people don't want lanes. I'll take your lanes, I'll take your sidewalks, and there's no lights in some of our neighborhoods. I'll take those lights, and I think that um, there's a lack of communication, so I, I like to um, either make this into a work study or continue this to, to have a, a deeper conversation on this issue. If I could respond to that quickly, the, my fear is streets are still being built, bike lanes are going in, and they're all going in under those separate policies that we have accepted the plans as a council, so they are established policies by us. And if they continue, I, I'm just fearful that it will end up that it doesn't match with what we come up with. Uh, I think if we could have someone working to consolidate it, bring it back to a work study group in September where we could really delve into it, but I'm concerned that we're going to delay a lot of projects or you're going one or the other. You're either going to delay them or you're going to allow them to go forward under what's currently on the books. They're going to move forward because it's currently on the books. Policy's into play. Staff's going to say, this is what you voted on and we're going to be doing this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I believe there's going to be other things in the near future that's not going to be addressed by this, by this policy handbook that we're going to create. And I think there's a, we got to find what the core issue is 
and I believe what the core issue is the lack of communication be between the departments and I think we need to fix the main issue instead of um, putting a little band-aid on what's needed right now. Mayor, just one last comment and I'm done. But <laughs> if I may. Oh, you know, I feel like it's just believe the that, illogic so. of this. I mean, you know, really what you're seeing here is the uh, basically the silo. You know, you're going to be paying for this because the city staff just doesn't want to work together, can't work together, can't figure out a way to work together, a way to mesh this themselves. You as taxpayers are going to be paying for this. And if you think a manual is going to solve internal problems that we have internally already within the city of Phoenix, this manual ain't going to do it. It's just going to be another document that's going to sit on someone's wall, sit on someone's desk, and it's not going to be used. It's, it's just a, a gloss over for already inefficiencies. By moving this forward today, you're forcing staff to basically sit back and say, hey, this is going to be someone else's responsibility. No, it is their responsibility. That is what they're being paid to do, and that is what they should do and they should do it right the first time themselves. So by doing this, you're just basically cre creating another gloss over here, and it's just gonna be one more thing that's added on because it sounds nice, it looks good. At the end of the day, it's nothing more than government waste. Thank you, Mayor, and I'm done. I, I, I don't think this is gonna be put in bookshelf because I think this is actually going to be a manual so when someone comes in to do a development they're going to say what they're going to be told here's what we want to see depending on what type of development it is if it's a one acre horse property type of development hopefully there'll be development standards that address whether or not there should be lighting sidewalks and there then you hand them a detail I'm not a good draw but a detail like this and you can say this is what you need to do because you're implementing the policies that the council adopted. So I, I think we need to move forward. I do like the idea, Councilman Nowakowski and Mayor, you brought up about having something perhaps in September and starting to review some of the work that's being done to make sure they're meeting the requirements. As you said, in your, in your district, you want more <laughs> lights, you want more sidewalks. I have neighborhoods that are up against the preserve and they don't want the lights, they don't want the sidewalks. So I think it's worthy of that discussion, but it would be helpful if we had some detail, some standards to look at so that we can have that discussion. I think it's a great idea though, Councilman Alkowski and Mayor Williams to have that work study. Well, hearing no more comments. Yeah, I'm uh, Motion to approve, yeah. and we have a there second, a second, I believe. Yeah. Uh, roll Here call. DeCicio. No. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Mayor, I want to explain my, my vote. I'll be voting um, yes on this because of that work study that you promised that we would be having. If that is correct, <laughs> right? I do promise. All right. You You're be going to get real sick of work All studies. Right. <laughs> All right. With that, that'll be sick a yes. Pastor. Yes, um, and uh, I would like to make sure that Councilman Alkowski is at every work study that we're having. Thank you. <laughs> he will be. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Mayor Williams. Yes. 62. Passes. Thank you. Item 159, and move a motion for 159. Second. Uh, okay. We have a motion and a second. Leonard Clark. Still here? He left. Okay. Uh, any comments? Roll call. DeCicio. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Yes. Mayor Williams. Yes. Eight to zero. Move approval of item uh, 207. 207. Do I have a second? I need a second. Yeah, second. Okay, we have a second. Oh, we have two. Can cards. we do 207 and 208 together? Or, yes. Or, okay. Oh, 207 and 208 so. together? Yeah, they're, they're together. I guess. Uh, the second concurred? Who's the second? Yeah. Okay. okay, she does. 
Um, we have a card in favor and a card opposed on both items. Uh, I will ask uh, Taylor, Earl, to come forward. Well, I guess, do you want to tell us what's going on first and what the process has been so far? And Give us Cer a recommendation. Certainly, Mayor Williams, members of council. Items 207 and 208 are related items. Item 207 is the final abandonment resolution to dissolve the public's interest in right-of-way for North 30th Drive and West Coulter Street. And item 208 is the uh, action to sell that right-of-way to Grand Canyon Education, Inc., who was the high bidder that met all the requirements for $122,000. Uh, the council will re recall that back in October 21st of 2015, you heard this item, which was really the legislative discussion under number uh, 207 to abandon or not. So at that time, uh, there was a request from GCU that focused on this area. This map shows you purple, which is the land that Grand Canyon University owns. The white are uh, private parcels that they didn't own at that time, some of which has changed, uh, but in for this particular instance, these two properties here they still do not own. And so this next slide uh, zooms into those particular areas. So there was an abandonment hearing that was appealed uh, to the mayor and council, and uh, the mayor and council did ultimately approve that abandonment for this portion of Coulter Street and this portion of 30th Drive shown in the crosshatch here. As part of that abandonment, there were a number of stipulations that were put on that property. Uh, it ultimately was litigated by one of the folks uh, who uh, was uh, impacted by this. They didn't want to see that happen, and uh, but they lost that in court um, through uh, an appeal in court as well. There are stipulations that require them to provide public uh, easement so that you can still get to all of those properties. Uh, there really is something that GCU is doing to ensure safety of their students from their perspective. They want to be able to, to have a, a guard gate there to monitor people coming into the campus. But they, as part of this requirement uh, and meeting the stipulations, they're dedicating uh, easements to those properties for bulk trash pickup for any users today or any users in the future of those properties. They all will get access to those properties pursuant to a public access easement that goes across the Coulter Street properties uh, to allow them access. So what we're really doing today is we've already approved the abandonment. We're just approving that they've met the stipulations. Mayor Williams, um, Council, that is correct for item 207. It's uh, in, in kind of the, the terminology of Councilman Williams, or, or I mean, uh, Councilman Waring, it is paying the check to the council action of 2015 that said you can go forward and abandon this property. GCU now has expended a lot of funds to go forward and do those things. Uh, and so now this is that final action saying you are the high bidder in item 208, so you are able to, um, to purchase it. In 207, you've met all the steps. Staff has gone through and done all that verification, and we're happy to answer any other questions that you have. Uh, I will have the, uh, go ahead and have a hearing on this, I guess, to have the applicant you want to speak? I'll just briefly say and then maybe reserve your time for rebuttal if there's anything that I could respond to. But my name is Taylor Earl with Earl Curley and Lagarde. Here on behalf of GCU, our address is 3101 North Central Avenue. So as Mr. Stevenson said, really the merits of whether this road should be abandoned was, was something that was done about two and a half years ago. It was voted unanimously by the council. We worked extensively with the community, including Mr. Palmer, who I believe has submitted a card um, to try to work out stipulations that would protect access, protect access to the Little Canyon Trail, would make sure that the roadway could not be narrowed, um, that we'd have to maintain the condition in, in, a, in a condition commensurate with public roadways. So as to those private properties, it would effectively function like a private, like a regular street. Uh, they'd have access around the, the guard gates and an express lane so they wouldn't have to be stopped every time. So all those many stipulations were worked out. Um, and then after that, it did go through litigation. The trial court upheld the city council's decision. The court of appeals upheld the city council's decision. And so GCU went forward and expended tens of thousands of dollars in reliance on, hey, if we complete these stipulations, then this will be abandoned. And so as Mr. Stevenson said, we're really at that wrap-up scene of, okay, you've complied with it, and, and then now we're going forward. Um, and so, again, I'll reserve any time to the extent there's questions okay. that I can be helpful on. Thank you. Uh, Gail Palmer?
Yes. Yes, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Mayor Williams and Council. Uh, my name is Gail Palmer. My address is 7227 North 35th Avenue, Phoenix 85051. Uh, this should not be here today. I want to, this has been a public street for 90 years. Just because some fat cat comes into town, everybody's going to bow to him and uh, give up their streets. You may be next, but I remember my mom and dad in 50, 51, they had to pay to pave that street, their half of the street. Uh, it really worked a hardship on them at that time, uh, them paying for a public street that they had to pay their half of. Uh, this shouldn't even be here because in August, in J July of 15, of 15, they, GCU went, there was a hearing officer at that meeting. He, he said he needed to go under advisement and he would give us an answer. On I think it was August the 4th, he come out with 10 stipulations. Uh, and he stated in there that these stipulations had to be done before it could go any further or they could get ownership of this. Uh, this st there's one stipulation that has not been done and that's one reason I say this should not be here today. Uh, why hasn't it been done or why, why I can't tell you. The, the other point that uh, I would like to bring up is there's two or three things, but I know I'm going to run out of time. The, the price the city is getting out of all of this abandonment property uh, compared to what the real property is selling for within this, these abandonments. Uh, I was here last October trying to discuss that, trying to embarrass you about letting them buy that, that those abandonment streets for 350 a, uh, a square foot. Uh, this one, I think, is like 80 cents a square foot. Uh, the, the, the point is, GCU's bought property on both sides of these abandonments, and I think the cheapest price that they've paid is $9.00. 55 cents a square foot. The highest is right at $85 a square foot. You're giving this property away to GCU for 85 cents a foot, uh, 350 a foot. Okay. Uh, the the other thing, once this guard shack goes into play and they man it, it's been there for three years. Uh, two, it'll be three years when school starts. I do believe, but but anyway, um, the harassment that I and my family and my neighbors have suffered from being uh, harassed, false police reports, uh, police an injunction uh, against me looking at prison time, that uh, uh, this will not make it better, it's just going to make it a lot worse. Uh, the, the other thing I'd like to point out, hey, this is an election year. Please register and get out to vote and maybe replace some of these council people. Thank you. I'm not saying, I'm talking about Council oh, 5. You. Thank you. Uh, John Mendeville? Uh, Mendeville? John, can I just Council do the on? Thank you. Honorable Mayor, Council Members, Honorable Council. I'm John Mandibles. My address is um, 1917 East Fairmont Avenue. I'm a veteran. I'm a member of the American Legion. Uh, this issue with Mr. Palmer and GCU has been an ongoing issue, of course. This council has attributed its movement in courts and with its staff, very capable staff, in, in getting to this process, to the finite of this process. So what I'm doing here today is I'm here because today on this day, D-Day, the longest day, an act was signed by our president, the VA Mission Act of 2018. 
In that act, it provides for $59 billion for veteran issues in health care needs and housing care and in the care of the veterans for home care needs. So with Mr. Earl's land in play, hopefully, and in the, in the disposition of its location in GCU, there is an accommodation in that act for veterans coming out of service, not homeless veterans, come veterans coming out of service, to be housed and transitioned for the purpose of education. So I would like to ask this honorable counsel, perhaps Mr. Uh, Palmer, Mr. Earl is a very kind man, uh, to look at those projects, to look at those proposals, to consider those proposals once they come to you, as much as you considered the abeyances and the dispositions you gave GCU and Mr. Palmer, because you've been very graceful on both accounts. I can say that because I've witnessed it. Thank you. It, thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you. James? Well, Mayor, we do. Can't hear you. Oh, we want to thank you, John, as a council, for your service and all that you've done for our country. Uh, he's not just a member of the American Legion, he's also one of the top leaders in the American Legion. I think you need to recognize that. I think you're being very humble today. But thanks for everything that you do, John. Thank you, Councilman Desencio. Thank you, Council Mayor. Uh, James Stibler. Hello, I am James Dibler. I live in Phoenix, Arizona. The reason I support this plan because Grand Canyon University is growing with a lot of new students and they need to buy the street from the city of Phoenix to expand their campus. I agree with the veterans guy that we need more education funding for veterans so we can get education to go to college or graduation school. And I noticed that GCU is growing every day because they count on students to go to college to get their degree or a certificate. I graduated from Glendale Community College with my associate in general studies and photography certificate. Currently, I go to ASU for my public service and public policy. Thanks for no time and consideration. Uh, does anyone on the council have any questions? Councilwoman? Uh, question for our staff. Uh, were there stipulations that GCU was required to meet, and did they ma meet them? Mayor Williams, uh, Council McGaigo, yes. There were a number of stipulations that they met, and they, uh, they were required to meet, and they have met all of those stipulations. No, please. Any other so, questions, uh, Councilman? With one cap, assuming the council approves item 208, which is to then sell them the land, that's the, the last thing to fulfill their stipulation. So 207 says, uh, item 207 is here's all your stipulations. They've complied with those stipulations. And then uh, item 208 is the final disposition of the land. Uh, and then that will be the, the final items that they would have to do. Mayor? Yeah. next. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Mr. Palmer? Then we'll come to you. Sorry? I was going to ask him a question. So you stated that there was one stipulation that they didn't fulfill. Which one is that? It's one that says that they will widen the sidewalk on the north side of Coulter from 30th Drive westward to the trail. They went up to their driveway that goes into the, their new business college. And there's about 50, there's 75 feet approximately that has not been widened. That's one of them. And uh, I guess uh, I'm not going to, this is 207, uh, will I not be able to speak on 208? You can combine I filled out, the two. I filled out two cards. And we combine the two items together okay. at this point. So. Well, I had lots more to say, but uh, thank you for your time. Can he speak on thank both you. Issues, right? mm -hmm. Can he speak on a the other any issue? Any other also? questions? The 208, you could speak you can on that speak if you on like. The same. 
Okay. 207 and 208 are together. So if you have something about to speak on 208, you're, you have time to speak on it. Well, there are several things that I haven't been able to say that I wanted to say. It's uh, about the abandonment. Uh, this, this, this is about this, this, this harassment that I've suffered over the years from false police reports and uh, accusing me of having guns, shooting them, and having a, uh, I'm sorry, a, being charged with a crime and uh, looking at two years in prison. Uh, this isn't going to get better because uh, I've got to go through their gate now and my people. Uh, they filed an injunction against me that I couldn't even get to my property. I've got two properties that I couldn't get within 100 feet. Uh, uh, I wished the city of Phoenix personnel would back and enforce the PUDs that's been made and the state laws. Uh, that would sure come a long, long ways to having the common man uh, have a chance fighting the fat cats. Thank you. Thank you. Follow-up question. Alan, so he said he was landlocked. Is that, can you explain that to us? So, Councilman Nowakowski, uh, Mayor Williams, members of council, the, the parcels uh, that Mr. Palmer owns uh, is right in here. It's kind of an L-shaped parcel. And so the access to that parcel uh, has historically been down Coulter and, and 30th Drive to that parcel. The abandonment area, which is in, you know, kind of in this box right here, does require that as a condition of the abandonment, they have to dedicate an access easement in perpetuity for anyone who wants to drive to these parcels to get access to it. So it is similar to a private street in a new subdivision uh, where they maintain the street, but anyone is allowed to go in and have a friend visit you at your house that you live there. Um, it's just not something that the public is maintaining. Suela. Thank you, Mayor. Again, the, this abandonment uh, is something that was approved by the council two and a half years ago. Uh, this happens to be in District 5. I've worked closely with the, with the community and GCU for the past several years. Uh, I, I'm actually, I'm proud of the work that we've been able to do. It's the fastest growing university in the country. In about a four mile radius, property values are up by 30%. Crime rates are down by 30%. There are kids in that neighborhood that are first generation college students. Many of them are going for free. Well, they're earning their way through through something called a learning lounge. These kids are, these young people are going in and they're teaching students, they're, they're tutoring high school students, this generation of college students. And those high school students, they do well enough to get into school. They can also go to school, and turn, but they also have to tutor the next generation. There are a lot of good things happening there. Uh, and, and it is growing at a pretty fast rate and uh, you know, Mr. Palmer, I have the utmost respect for. Mr. Mendibles, I have a great deal of respect for. Thank you for your service, sir. And Mr. Palmer, thank you for your service and all that you've done in the community and, and uh, in the, the neighborhood. Uh, working with GCU, with Mr. Palmer in mind, and, and you know, Mr. Palmer and Mr. Mendibles are here. Uh, Mr. Mendibles obviously here to support Mr. Palmer, and he's a, he's a, uh, he's a loyal, he's a good guy, good person. Uh, you know, whether we have one constituent who lives in this neighborhood that disagrees, in this case, that's Mr. Palmer, or if this council chamber was packed, I'd be, I would be working with GCU. And I'm proud of the response of GCU. Uh, Mr. Palmer's access is protected. He's not going to have to stop at that guard gate. His guest won't have to stop at the guard gate. In fact, GCU is working on a system, will agree to work on a system to identify some of his guests if he'd like if he'd like, because that can go both ways. So whatever, whatever it takes to make it easier to, uh, for, for uh, Mr. Palmer, uh, the full roadway will be maintained for access. Uh, the, the, there was a question of, of the bulk trash rights. Mr. Palmer's rights are protected there as well. Uh, and, and the list goes on. Safety is paramount for people who live in the neighborhood. Uh, 
like the person I, tr I, I respect so much and this gentleman, but also the more than the nearly 20,000 students that are there on campus during the school year. And uh, about half of them live on campus during the school year. So safety is paramount for everyone, obviously. So uh, this, this actually, uh, I'm proud of the way this, this has, has been done. And, uh, and I am su absolutely supportive of it. Okay. Uh Yes, we are voting on 207 and 208 together. One vote can do it, and it would be roll call. Please proceed. DeCicio? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Valenzuela? Yes. Waring? Yes. Mayor William? Yes. Okay, that takes us to 211. What was the count? Oh, eight, eight, zero. Eight, two, item 211, I know. I know. Okay, go ahead. Item 211, ordinance G6463, an ordinance amending chapter 9-1 of the city code by repealing existing construction code of the city of Phoenix, adopting 13 model codes with Phoenix amendments as the Phoenix building construction code and establishing effective date and providing for application for exceptions. Okay. Do we have I a move motion? a motion of item 211. I need and a second. <laughs> and I will second it. <laughs> All right, we have a motion and a second. Any comments, questions? Hearing none, roll call. DeCicio. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Madam Chair, I have a question. Oh, if we vote sorry. for this, are we going to get to drive downtown? Oh. Sorry. Not ah, necessarily. Just, Yes. <laughs> this is con building Mayor construction Williams. code. <laughs> Mayor Williams. Take Uber. Yes. <laughs> Eight zero. Eight zero. Okay. Is that? Oh, two twenty two. Two twenty two. I'm trying to get to my booklet in here. It two twenty two is a citizen's petition. Oh, the petitions. I'm sorry. I am trying to find it in my book. I move. Uh, hang on. Somewhere in my book I have. Oh, uh, item 222 is the full deployment of police body cameras. Um, I have a motion. Uh, move to forward this item to the Public Safety and Veterans Subcommittee to develop an, an aggressive implementation time frame once a vendor has been selected. A second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Discussion? Hearing none. Oh, I'm sorry, 222, yeah. Kim Baker. Once, once again, thank you, uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council. Um, I support the deployment of body cameras. Um, there, there's two items on there that I uh, would like to speak on, but I, I support uh, the petition and would ask this council to strongly consider expediting. I uh, understand there's a plan in effect. Our concern, working with the Joanne Scott Woods, our concern is the probability of another shooting that may not be um, documented or accounted for. And the transparency there um, benefits both sides, the police department as well as the citizens. And so I support the petition in expediting the full deployment. Thank you. Thank you. Joanne Scott Woods. Uh, 
Um, Mayor and City Council, um, I want to say I enjoyed uh, how Ken Baker opened this meeting with goodwill. Thank you, Kim. Um, PD, People Demanding Justice Community Coalition, of which I am co coordinator, has been dialoguing with the police department on our 10 solutions to build trust in our city since 2015. Body cams headed the list. Although my petition, as I stated, it was denied, we as a city will be moving forward on transparency regarding updates on progress, probably on the police website, in achieving full deployment and other solutions when we meet with Executive Assistant Chief Mike Kurtenbach and Commander Kimberly Mitchell of the Community Relations Bureau next week. I look forward to that. I was so disappointed in the rebuttal of the police contact involving Joshua Baker uh, by the police department and the city assistant city manager, Milt Tahoney, especially because this uh, Milt Tahoney wrote a letter of apology to his father after his harassment in 2015. I want to go on record addressing the three points listed on the city council report that were disputed by the facts on the traffic ticket and on the paperwork from the evidentiary hearing. One, a mandatory insurance suspension is identified in the report as a, quote, misdemeanor criminal violation, uh, but it is civil. Additionally, the hearing was heard in a civil court. Two, his fines were suspended on the two charges, but that was admitted in the report. Actions recorded at the first point of contact show an officer rushing and immediately opening the driver's door, bending over to go into the cab, pull the driver out before the driver could put his car in park, throwing him across the trunk in handcuffs, handcuffing him, taking him to the curb and sitting him down. All done in the matter of 44 seconds. I need you to wrap up, but thank okay. you. Okay. Um, revealing these truths uh, could uh, have brought us together in a spirit of reconciliation. Hopefully, uh, realistically, as Assistant Chief Kernbach informed me last week, body camps will be deployed within three years instead of five after council votes to approve that, perhaps in October of this year. Those in attendance, please stand up in solidarity of the truth that generation, generationally, black and brown po people have been harassed disproportionately by the police. Thank incidents, you. I just have six more words. All right, six uh, more incidents words. Incidents which will, body cams will someday bring to light or perhaps disperse. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not sure if it's Lisa or Leslie. Hi. No, you got it, Lisa. Okay. Uh, on, on the, and I didn't even know about the subject of the body cameras coming up, but um, I wanted to put out the body cams should be an immediate issue that needs to be fixed. We're seeing around the country where calls for body cams have been met, and body cams are on the police. And we're seeing all over the country now where there, there's this big cry for how pe I was racially profiled and racially harassed and racially this and racially that, and then the body cam comes out and only to find out that that was a lie. So while I don't think the body cams should be an issue of race, that seems to be the norm in today's politics. And to me, I think the body cams are there to protect the police as much as they are to protect the citizens. And five years is ridiculous. Mayor Stanton gave La Raza $2.4 million before he left office, and we can't put body cams on our police officers? That's a little bit ridiculous in my mind. You want to raise the tax in, in the city of Phoenix? You want to do all these things? Phoenix is broke. Take care of our officers. Take care of our police. Take care of our community. You can look at me funny, but it's already been, that's already, already been noted. And as for the, as for the guy that's, um, that uh, is promoting sex trafficking, calling us a hate group. You don't have to like my politics. Doesn't make us a hate group, okay? Thank you. 
Jennifer Harrison. Hello, my name is Jennifer, and I am representing the citizens that support the police department. And I feel like time and time again, we are coming down to the city council to support our men and women in blue. And the other side, they hate the police. They hate the police. They don't want the police policing their neighborhoods. Well, let me tell you what. Criminals have no race, okay? So when you don't mind the police and you don't follow the police's orders, they have a right to shoot you. They have a right to protect themselves and the community. So our police department deserve the best. And as much money as this city spends on nonsense, and you can roll your eyes as well, sir, but it's time that we start putting our men and women in blue first. So thank you very much. Back to thank you. Last card is Leonard Clark, and I think he left. OK. Any comments, Councilman? Thank you. Uh, I, as I mentioned, I second this motion. This is something that we've been talking about for far too long, right? A few years, several years ago. I remember when I first took office in 2012, we did a pilot program in Maryville. It was a body cam uh, pilot. And in fact, we still have officers uh, with the camera. Uh, and and uh, I've said it then. I. We'll continue to say it now. I, I think the, the, the body cam is a good idea. It's interesting how things evolve. I, I feel like literally everyone thinks the body cam is a good idea, uh, regardless of uh, where people come from or, or where, they, where people live. Uh, everyone agrees. And uh, I believe our police officers agree. It's, you know, I have some neighbors that are police officers. It's, it's, it's a tough job. And, uh, and so it's you know, something that we've been talking about, and uh, this, goes back, this goes back a couple of police chiefs ago. Uh, there's been a conversation about the, the software. How do we store this stuff? How, do we, how long do we have to store it? The legalities behind it and so on. And, uh, and I, you know, again, I've been a pretty strong uh, advocate then. We just got to figure that out. You know, we have to push through that. Uh, it's important to have, and I'm glad that we're actually here. And I want to thank our city manager and um, our, our city staff for always being willing to, to have that conversation. Thanks. Thank you. Councilman DeCicio? I just want to ask some logical questions. What is the current plan now, and then what is this so-called expedited process? What does it mean? I mean, what are you looking to accomplish? And, I mean, it, you know, it's, everything sounds nice, but and there's the nothing that I see here. Are you speaking about my motion, or are you? Yeah, well, oh, yeah, okay. the, the, the motion is to move it to the subcommittee to expedite it. Expedite it to what? Tell us um, what the current plan is first. OK. Um, you want the new current plan, or what my thought process were around oh, no, the I'm motion? Sorry. No, I was just, yeah, I was asking staff. Mayor, uh, members of council, the, the original discussion uh, was to uh, deploy body-worn cameras over a five-year period. That was based on the financial reality that we were dealing with at that particular time. Subsequent to that, uh, there's been action taken to accelerate the process to be able to do it over a three-year period. Presently, where we are is going through the process of executing an RFP to actually choose the vendor that will provide uh, the next round of body-worn cameras. And so that's cameras uh, that also includes our ability to deal with storage, our ability to deal with processing public records associated with that uh, item. So that, that's the plan uh, at present. And the vice mayor can speak to her own motion. And, well, if I could, just a couple things and I'll be done with sure. that part of it. Um, right now, the reason that it was also delayed is that it's not just the camera that everyone thinks that you have to wear. Uh, it, the camera in itself is the easiest and, most, and the least expensive part of it. It's the fact that you have to hire individuals to interpret the, the, the data 
and to store the data and to figure out what is and what isn't going to be released to the public. Uh, you know, so if you go into somebody's home and you scan around it because that camera is now taking a picture of everybody, what are you going to release out of that? What if you're sitting in a restaurant, police officer walks by, has a con not a confrontation but a, a conversation with somebody, that end up, ends up getting subpoenaed in. How does your the fact that you're sitting there having a ham sandwich, roast beef sandwich? Now are you going to be subject to, you know, being used into court? So there's a lot of information that had to be done. The three-year plan was done for a reason because it was done logically. It was done because it allows the city of Phoenix to be able to incorporate those kinds of things and work those things through. So I've got just one question. What does expedited mean? What is the plan? What do you want to do? How fast do you want to make it? Year and a half, two years, three? What do you want to do? Right now we're on a three-year plan. So uh, I asked for it to be thrown back to the Public Safety Veterans Subcommittee uh, to develop an aggressive implementa implementation time frame once the vendor is selected. Uh, earlier today I had a conversation. I was saying I have been sitting on uh, city council. It will be four and a half years, and I, we've been talking about body cameras and uh, implementation of body cameras has been delayed. Uh, it was delayed to the fact of the vendors, two vendors uh, fighting with one another. Finally, the other vendor purchased the other one, and now we have one vendor. Now we're throwing an RFP back out, and I was told once a vendor has been selected uh, within our group, we could uh, design a plan for implementation uh, out to the districts. Uh, I believe the public, and this is, I, I agree with the groups, both groups in the sense that it's a safety issue for both parties, um, and be able then to move and have the body cameras on the ground and be able to uh, see or be able to have evidence or see, see footage of what, what happened in an incident. Uh, if you looked at every one of our incidents reports w that we get, uh, it always says no war no body camera, no body camera. And I think this would help uh, um, in, in several incidents to, to be able to analyze uh, the footage. So that's what I was doing. May I follow up on that then too? Um, how many patrol officers do we have right now on patrol? Because that is the boots on the ground. So, Mayor Williams, Councilman DeCicio, to, to answer the question, and I think what you're asking is how many call-taking uniform police officers are out there responding to that 911 call? Because we have other uniforms right. that don't necessarily do that. Agreed. That's why it said the boots on the ground. J just over 1,100. 1,100. What percentage of those individuals currently wear a body cam? 300. Okay. So you're looking at expanding... 800 more officers with body cams. Uh, to answer the question, Councilman, ideally as we grow the department moving toward 3125, then we would have 1,286 uniformed first responders. That's just the first responders. But as I mentioned before, you have officers that ride motorcycles that don't count in that figure. We have neighborhood enforcement team officers. We have community action officers. So ideally, we would like to expand the program as much as is feasible to do so to ensure that we have maximum coverage. But to be specific, just in terms of uniforms, once we get to 3125, we'll have almost 1,300 first responders. And so of those, 300 currently have the body cams, correct? Those are the on patrol. With the exception, They're out of the districts. With the exception of 17 cameras that are assigned to our crisis intervention squads, the ones that serve the emergent mental health pickup orders, the rest are all first responders. Okay, and so of those individuals, there's 800. Those are the ones that are on the three-year plan, correct? Are we going to be expanding it to the entire 3125, or is it just to the 1300? The plan would be to put them on the uniforms. So I don't think it would be prudent, Councilman, to give them to detectives who not are necessarily forward-facing, engaging the community on a daily basis. 
Uh, talking about a thoughtful plan going forward, though, there's opportunities to go beyond the uniformed first responders, as I just mentioned before. But ideally, what we would like to do, and I know Chief Williams is very committed to doing this, those officers that engage the public on a regular basis, that are responding to 911 or crime stop calls or conducting traffic or subject stops, the goal is to have them wearing the technology as soon as is practicable to do so. And that's 1,300, well, 1,100 today, 1,300 when we're at full capacity, correct? Yes, sir. And so of those, what is the cost for that additional 800 to 1,000 body cams, including the data and everything else? Councilman, um, we will be able to determine that better once the RFP respondents um, send in their plans and we're able to properly evaluate it. Right now, we're, we're in search of a vendor to provide that. So until we actually go through that process, we wouldn't be able to give you a definitive answer. And so, and just one last question uh, on the record then. We're only looking at those 1,300 that would be employed and would be the, the uniforms on the ground having communication. The additional, you know, amounts, depending on where we are with the number at the time, would not be required to wear the body cams, correct? Or are we talking about using body cams on detectives and others? SAU? I mean. so, so, Councilman, I'm not being coy, but I want to make sure that I answer the question that you're yeah. asking. Our priority is to outfit uniformed, call-taking first responders first. But I think we have to be diligent and look at best practices around the nation, look at what makes sense as we police our city to see if, as you mentioned, our special assignments unit officers, known as SWAT in other jurisdictions, does it make sense to put the technology on them? Perhaps. Does it make sense to have our motor officers, as I mentioned earlier, wear the technology? Perhaps. But what we want to do is we want to make sure, being in a very transparent police department, is that we capture any interaction with the community to the best extent, to the greatest extent possible. So I'm a proponent, I know Chief Williams is, once we identify a vendor, uh, more cameras is better, so you have a greater likelihood of capturing an entire incident, not just from one perspective. But to say today that only those 1,300 at full staffing will wear the cameras, I don't think that's fair to say. And that's a policy debate for later because once you employ, if you're talking about 3,125 as a minimum officer, I think the number needs to be higher anyways. The data storage on something like that is insane and it's going to be exorbitant. And, you know, we can talk about how nice it is going to be to do all that and have all these individuals wear these cameras, but when you look at the final cost of that outside of the boots on the ground, I think you're going to end up having a problem with that. I'm not going to be supportive of the motion because I, I think we're on plan right now, but at the end of the day, when we start looking at, uh, you know, and even thinking about putting it on an individual who works even at a desk or puts it on a detect, it just, it's, Ill, it's illogical for me. Thanks a lot, Mayor. So, uh, I, um, do we have money in this year's budget, or the coming budget, for additional cameras, and how many? Mayor, yes, there's currently $5 million that has been set aside for this program that's available now, next year, whenever we get the procurement done. And how many does that buy? That's, that's a good question. We're not sure because of how the, the technology cost. is changing and some things are going up uh, as the councilman oh. said the cameras generally are becoming cheaper and cheaper but the storage is oh. where the money is and the people to manage the storage storage so we we just don't have a good sense right now of that of that cost. Uh, i will support the motion providing that when uh you come back uh to the subcommittee and talk about the costs and the availability you include all of the costs I want to know how much it's going to cost to store and whatever, and I want to make sure we're transparent, but I, we have to consider that as part of our budget. Yes, we'll do that. Mayor? Yes. Just one more thing, and I'm looking forward to, I know that, you know, we, there has to be a selection process and all of those things. Uh, this, is a, this is a great way to, uh, to make uh, the police department more innovative, uh, through technology, the, the software there, 
the software that you can find out there now with body cams allow police officers to to keep their hands freed up right now they're doing a ton of paperwork uh, you'd be surprised what is out there people being able to officers having an opportunity to record a conversation uh, some of those things going right into the computer system some of the software that firefighters are using from throughout the valley and I know Phoenix is catching in this case right but but some of the information uh, it used to be that, that doing the paperwork took the longest and obviously because of liability and, and everything else you have to be careful there's no comparison between the paperwork that firefighters do in the field versus what police officers do in the field so this is going to give our officers an opportunity to patrol more to uh, keep their hands free the list goes on and on it's not just a, a camera recording someone it's going to help that officer do their job and uh, in turn I believe uh, I believe potentially making it a, a, a safer city so this is a, a, a great example of how we can use technology and innovation to help move public safety forward in particular our police uh, department so I'm, I'm glad that it's being supported uh, by the mayor as well uh, it doesn't surprise me she's been such a she's been the strongest advocate for police officers so thank you Expediting body cameras is great public policy. It will be a win for our officers and a win for the community. So I'm glad to see this going forward. I think it's worth noting that earlier in today's agenda, this council unanimously voted to support an additional expenditure to support the body camera program. So we do have support for that program. We want it to be innovative and cost effective. Uh, I get to work on the efficiency subcommittee with my colleagues here and We've been definitely paying attention to the records management process. We need to be able to transparently produce records in an expedited way for people who need it. Um, we've had some, some difficult stories about people who needed records and couldn't get them, and so we have to do this in a responsible way. Uh, transparency is very important, and the mayor has been an advocate for transparency in the police department. Front page of the newspaper recently. Um, I, I think it's Councilman Stark. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh, no, I'll, I, will, I will take a hint and conclude. Thank you. <laughs> Did you, you want, uh, Councilman? Okay. Well, I guess I'd, I'd just say, you know, the day will come when everybody's got the body camera. I'm not sure today is, is the day. How far behind on public records requests is the department right now? Bless you. Uh, Mayor Williams, Councilman Waring, as you know, there was a time where we were almost 22 months behind but I'm happy to say we are up to April of 2018 now with our public records project. So it's still take, I mean, you've been working on it, so it's still taking a while. I guess I have concerns about creating complicated to deal with, as Councilman DeCicio mentioned, public records. The comment about the, uh, there was an item in our agenda earlier, that was to support the already existing cameras. That wasn't for new cameras. So that's not expanding the pool of 300 in any way. Um, uh, I do think, at some point, this will happen. I'd rather spend excess money we have right now hiring more police officers than, than doing the cameras, which get used, but you know, not every traffic stop results in using this data, but it still gets collected. It's gotta be stored, correct? I mean, you can't get rid of it. Um, at some point, obviously, technological innovations, things will get more uh, efficient. The two companies who were fighting over this before merged. That sometimes produces efficiencies and innovation and so forth. But I, I would have qualms trying to expedite something that I already thought was moving a little too fast, given what the technology is right now. So I'm going to vote no. Thank you. I, I wanted to amend my motion, and I wanted to, in the amendment, I wanted to ask in the September subcommittee that um, there would be a cost analysis uh, when we discuss this in September at the Public Safety Veterans Subcommittee. Okay. Does the second concur? Okay. Yes. She does. Um, you know, I'm going to agree with Laura. <laughs> <laughs> Let's, Let's do roll call. <laughs> what was the motion? The motion was to, on uh, the September subcommittee, to have a cost analysis 
at the September subcommittee regarding the body cameras, the storage, all of it to know what the cost is. Okay, not, nothing else? Okay, I'm good with that. Um, I'd like to hear that. Okay. I'd like to know what the numbers I know. are. I know you do. Thank you for that. Well, yes. You're, you're, I'm wait. adding it to my We're motion. Adding it to oh, it's added or? Go to the subcommittee to discuss right. expediting. Here's and my as motion. part of that, have a cost analysis as yes. best we know yes. it in September. And I will okay. move, oh, wait. move to forward this item to Public Safety and Veterans Subcommittee to develop an aggressive implementation time frame once a vendor has been selected. In addition, I would like a cost analysis of the body cameras, the whole package, meaning uh, storage, all the pieces that go into body cameras. Mayor. Clarity? No. Okay. Councilman. As the chair of the public safety, this has been a conversation we've had for a while. I know that they're looking at best practices throughout the country. I'm not sure how much time would you all need to actually bring back that information. Would September be enough time for you all? Because I know that you had like a four month window or something like that you're looking at. Uh, Mayor, members of council, we certainly can comply with uh, the intent of what the vice mayor is asking for, but uh, we would not be able to do a full cost analysis in the month of September. What we, what, what we were waiting for is the pricing information from the vendors, but we can do a cost analysis as best we can. So you can do an estimate. Yes. Uh, yes. I'm like, like we do in other subcommittees where there's an estimate of the possibility of this. Uh, and then what happens is once the vendor is chosen, then it comes back to our subcommittee. It'll get refined. And then it's t we're told, well, this is really what it's going to cost for what right. you're asking for. So you need to make a decision of, do we want to add money or do we want to uh, subtract something on this? Right. But it is possible. Right. Okay. Yes. Okay, I'm gonna call for the question, no call. DeCicio. No. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Mayor Williams. Yes, six to two. Uh, I think that's 223. Move item 223. Do I have a second? Move. What, what's no, the what's the motion? What's the it's motion? Got, well, oh, I'm the sorry. petition. Oh, I have this one. Uh, this one is in District 8, so I could okay. offer an, a motion yes. if that would be okay with the, the Vice Mayor. I would like to move that we deny the petition and direct the Arts and Culture Commission to study how and where the city can support the Chinese community and its partners in celebrating and honoring the rich cultural heritage of Phoenix's Chinese community. We have a motion and a second. We do have uh, cards, and I will ask them to try to yeah, keep their, their speech to two minutes, if you can. Uh, I will allow you to support another person, two people, can donate time to one by the maximum of the uh, six minutes. And that includes any presentation or video. Tom Simon. And uh, if you could uh, speak to the motion. I have some, I have some documents for the council. Can I get a point of clarification from you, uh, Mayor? Uh, since I have uh, the one that filed the petition, uh, what are the time constraints that you have me under? Well, everyone has an opportunity to speak for two minutes. Uh, and I had heard you were gonna have some people donate time to you, but I'm gonna limit that to two people can donate so you could have a maximum of six minutes if you have those donations. All right, we do, and uh, but we, I think I only need four minutes. Sounds better. Thank okay. you. Okay. 
Mayor and Council people, uh, I'm Thomas Simon. I represent Chinese United, which represents uh, 29 uh, Asian American organizations here in the Phoenix metro area. I also represent Chef Tian, Beijing Garden Restaurant, Super Al Ranch Market, and Sichuan Palace Restaurant. My uh, conversation is uh, mainly going to be directed to Councilwoman uh, Diego's, Diego, because uh, I believe that uh, because it's in your district, how you vote on these kinds of things is vitally important. And uh, whether you vote uh, for this uh, petition uh, will uh, sway others on the council. I want to thank you, first of all, for meeting with us today. I appreciate that. Councilman Valenzuela did not uh, take time to meet with us. I want the minorities who are watching or listening to this to understand that uh, when a minority uh, group wanted to talk with him about a petition, he refused to meet with us. There are two things that this petition talks about. One of them is the conduct of True North versus Charlie Lai and Super L Ranch market. True North sued Charlie Lai after he talked to this council in uh, s September of last year. And he told the council to be careful about how they dealt with True North because he doubted that they were honest. True North sued Charlie Lai for defamation for the words that he used to the council. The court dismissed True North's case, and I've supplied you with the minute injury of the court, labeled uh, Exhibit A. And the court said, the court finds the complaint in this matter was filed to deter or infringe upon defendant's exercise of his constitutional rights, such as those statements he made at a Phoenix City Council meeting during which the plaintiff's purchase of and repurposing of the Chinese Cultural Center had been treated by plaintiff. The court finds that the anti-slap law applies as the complaint filed by plaintiff qualifies as a legal action within the meeting. So the court found that True North was in violation of the law by suing somebody who came to the city council. We're asking for you as a city council to say, not in our back door, not in our yard. We don't want you big companies to come sue people because they talk at city council meetings. The court has already established that they did that. They dismissed the case. You have the full uh, court minute entry that tells you why they dismissed the case against Charlie Lai and why they sanctioned True North. True North's attorneys are here today. I saw them. It's good to see them here today. They're probably going to speak. I would remind you that you could buy all the lipstick at Nordstrom, and if you put it on a pig, it's still a pig. So remember that when they get a chance to address you. The second item uh, in our petition asks that uh, the council make sure that they tell True North that it is not acceptable the way that they treated Beijing Gardens. Chef Tian Mayor is in the audience today. He owns Beijing Garden Restaurant, and he suffered at the hands of True North True North and their attorneys uh, orchestrated a scheme to cut Chef Tian's phone lines four times, to cut his internet four times, to steal their electricity and move the electricity into their name and then shut the electricity off in the middle of lunchtime when people were eating. They did that to this family business. Right there, Chef Tian. They put him out of business by doing what the court said, and I supplied you with the court's talking points. Mr. Payne, who's sitting right here, said to the court, and so they know that they're not supposed to cook, so if they then cook, we haven't created that danger they have, right? And the court said, no, criminally wrong. No, I mean ridiculously, criminally wrong. 
The court said the fact that you, speaking to Mr. Payne, would say that to me is amazing to me. If you create a condition where people can get hurt and then say, well, it's only a danger if they continue the, to operate and have people in there, otherwise it's our property. We can do with it what we want. You're going to be across the street, the court told him, in the South Court Tower facing criminal charges if you're doing that. This kind of behavior is unacceptable. True North is not a good corporate citizen. They put this man out of business by using criminal acts against him. And we're asking this city council to say, not in our city. Finally, and I'll wrap it up, the Chinese Restaurant Association has written a letter, and I'll forward it to you, supporting the, this petition. They represent hundreds of Asian uh, restaurants in this community. And they have asked you, Mayor and City Council, to send a message today because their constituents, owners of small Chinese businesses and Asian restaurants in this community, are afraid that it could be them next, that somehow, somewhere, somebody like Mr. Payne and True North will show up and use criminally wrong acts to put them out of business. So we ask you to consider that when you consider this petition. And I want to finally uh, say, Ms. Diego, we thank you again for uh, meeting with us today. We think it's important, as you run for mayor, that uh, the minority population, including the Asian population, understands who really stands up for minorities in the city of Phoenix. Thank you very much. Come on. Kim Baker. I'm, I'm just going to be brief. I have had, thank you, Mayor, Council, uh, uh, Ms. Gallego. I've had conversations with uh, the Chinese community, and um, I stand in support. Um, I feel their pain. And, um, you know, America was looked at at one time as the great melting pot. It's where a place where people believed that they can come and um, bring something to the table to help create a, an oasis for all to, to abide in. And, you know, I'm, I'm looking at, I like jambalaya. I don't know about you. But if you take the crab legs out, I don't know what you have. I don't compare the Chinese community to crab legs, but they are very vital to our existence. Thank you. Thank you. George Ortiz, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor, Council Members. Good afternoon. My name is George Ortiz. I'm Chairman of Legislative District 19. I'd like to stand up in support of the Phoenix Chinese Cultural Center. We hope the City Council will vote to condemn True North companies for its illegal actions against its renters at the uh, Phoenix Chinese Cultural Center. We believe the actions taken by True North and its subsidiaries against Beijing Gardens do not represent the best practices in the city of Phoenix. We stand here in support of our friends and the Chinese people in support of the Chinese Cultural Center. I've been a friend of the city council for many years and an activist on the west side and a radio host and a good friend of some city council members here. Until today, I've sat in the chambers in support of all our, of our officers and of other programs before this council and the mayor. Today, I must stand and give my support to the very important cause and thank you for your attention, your time. Thank you very much for coming down. Jen Yu Chin.
Mayor and Council Members, my name is Jin Wei Chen, and the crisis of the Chinese Culture Center has been lasting for more than 10 months. In this period of time, I have seen how the city of Phoenix discriminates, prejudices, persecutes our local Chinese American community, small businesses, and renter. Our first abandonment rights, including the speech here before the council members, were brutally intimidated. Our religious rights was abstracted by the city for illegally issuing the to two North Company subsidiary 668 North. Because of you encouragement, our communities have, has felt the institu institutional racial discrimination and, and religious di di discrimination. There are rumors that we don't care about the center or it is accomplished with Chinese communist government. However, what the city has done is the accomplice with the communist. You are working with the communist to persecute our local Chinese community. It's a scandal. Communist China, I mean the communist manager is corrupt and you work with them to try to damage the Chinese culture center. This is the Republican Republic country, and you work with the communist. Just be careful about the communist. If you don't care about the local community, and uh, so I have one question to ask Councilwoman Gallego. I know you are running for the mayor of the city, Phoenix. If you don't care about the local community with interest, what, in, what interest are you running for? If you don't care, I think more Sanchez might be the better for the position. Thank don't you, discriminate sir. our Chinese, several Chinese culture center. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Leslie Anton. Not Leslie, Lisa. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not Leslie. Lisa. Short person <laughs> microphone. Um, <laughs> Hey guys, this is Lisa Anton again. So this is actually the reason why I came today. When we were back in September, when we were, came to stand up for the police for, I don't know, the third or fourth or fifth time, um, the Chinese Cultural Center was on the same day. And until then, I hadn't heard anything about it. And we got to, we spent, what, how long was that city council meeting? Maybe nine hours? So we spent nine hours getting to know these people and talking to them and listening to their stories. And it's it's heartbreaking and while the i understand that the the deal is done and there's not a lot that can be done at this point to probably save the chinese cultural center i think that that's a, a blight on phoenix um that watching kids come up and cry at the thought of losing this place that means so much to them and to understand it's a business deal and it's done but I would, I would ask, and especially Gallego, okay, Councilwoman Gallego, this is your district. And I know that you've gone on Tucker Carlson and spoken up for illegal aliens. I would ask that you stand up for the Chinese Americans, for the American citizens that are hurting. They are a minority community and they need your voice. And they need you to stand up and say that we do not allow bullying of big corporations in our communities. And if you can't do that, then you need to look at where you should be in this city because it shouldn't be sitting up there. You don't represent one group of people. You represent all groups in your district. And the actions of this corporation against this small business owner are hideous. And I'm a capitalist. I'm a 100% down the line capitalist, but I don't believe in bullying. And that is bullish behavior, what they've done, and it's criminal behavior. And it's on you. It's on all of you to, to denounce it. But Kate Gallego, it's on you the Thank hardest. You. Thank you. David Giles. David here.
Mayor, council members, thank you for allowing me to speak to you. My name is Dave Giles. I'm running for United States Congress here in CD9. I have a bachelor of science degree in electrical engineering and a master's degree in business administration, and I'm a jet pilot. My career has afforded me the opportunity to work both domestically and foreignly. And when I worked overseas, I worked overseas in Saudi Arabia for more than 22 years. There I learned many different cultures and the value that is within them. Many of my friends are Chinese. They're over there still. But I learned to appreciate the Chinese culture, the Chinese art, and not only the paintings, but the rosewood, teakwood. And I would encourage you as much as I possibly can to help preserve the Chinese Cultural Center. There's value there. I appreciate it, and I'm sure there's a whole lot of other people here that appreciate it as well. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Bon Ho? Bon? Hi, uh, Mayor and uh, Councilman. Um, my name is Fang Ho. Uh, first, I would like to tell you a real-life real story. 20 years ago, a family with two little girls and their parents moved into a new house. They planted trees in the front yard and the backyard. One day, for some reason, the dad wanted to decide to cut down one of the trees. But his wife and the girls wanted to keep the tree because they love it. Um, they discussed, and the wife pointed out that cutting down the tree wouldn't resolve any issue. So eventually, the dad uh, reconsidered. In the, the total, uh, today, the tree is still there. So I think the Chinese Culture Center faces the similar issue. For 20 years I live here, I didn't see anything wrong from outside of it. I don't believe that the glaze, the color tiles, the garden could be the reason that the business went, uh, not went well. There was no proof. So instead of uh, my point is, if it is a management issue, we should change the man management instead of changing the outside look of the center. According to the experience of Beijing Garden, Sichuan Palace, and the Super L Ranch Market, the management of the center does have serious problem. That's why I supported the petition. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer Harrison. Hi, I just wanted to say that Patriot Movement, AZ, we stand with our Chinese community here. These are some of the most hardworking, law-abiding, successful Americans that we have here in our community. And to hear the stories of what the gentlemen from Beijing Gardens have been put through um, with the criminal acts against their business as a business owner and um, having them removed from the building and, and locked out. It's heartbreaking. We understand it is a business deal and the transaction is done and there's not a whole lot that can be done. But what we ask of the city of Phoenix is to stand up and, and, and denounce this corporate bullying and these practices of threatening and intimidating citizens that, that aren't as financially able to defend themselves in court. And um, yeah, so we ask that City of Phoenix stands up and denounces True North and their actions that they've taken against the citizens of Phoenix. Thank you. Hold your applause. Christopher Payne. Mayor, council members, thank you for your time. 
Uh, I am apparently the pig that Mr. Simon uh, was referring to wearing lipstick today. Uh, but I represent 668 North and True North companies. I have represented them through the litigation that has been referenced in this petition as well. Uh, I think my goal during my time here is to provide a little bit of reality and a fact check to the fiction that's being advanced here that True North is one, a bully, and two, has no respect for the Chinese community. The facts, quite simply, don't support that fiction and are contrary uh, to those concepts and those thoughts. So let me start by addressing this idea that we were engaged in some criminal behavior or, or conduct. <clears throat> conduct excuse me. Uh, Judge Witten had a hypothetical conversation with me during a hearing. He made it clear it was hypothetical. He did not take any evidence. He made it clear he wasn't making any factual findings. Two days later, after Mr. Simon issued a press release accusing me of criminal uh, conduct, accusing my client of criminal conduct, we were again in front of Judge Witten. Mr. Simon elected not to provide you with the transcript from that hearing. But in that hearing, Judge Witten very clearly said that he did not intend to make any findings that any of our actions were criminal nor did he make any findings. He clarified that it was a hypothetical discussion, and he added he was offended at the characterization that he had reached a conclusion that any of our acts were criminal. Quite simply, they are not and were not criminal. Now let's talk about the, the concept here. That, those, that notion of criminal behavior was raised in litigation. The litigation has been advanced by the Chinese community. There have been six, at least six pieces of litigation targeting my client individually or as entities. Three of those have reached some sort of resolution to which we've Please prevailed in on. those. Thank you, Your Honor. I certainly will. But let me just clarify the, the actions here that were supposed to be bullying. This is a commercial landlord tenant situation. We received an order, I think you have it in front of you, uh, from the court that said we could continue with our self-help remedies. And that's exactly what we did. There is no ruling from any court that said okay. we engaged in criminal activity. Thank you. Hey, knock it off. Stephen Anderson. Mayor, members of council, good evening. Uh, Stephen Anderson, for your record, True North Central, 15th floor in Phoenix. We also represent True North and uh, 668 and David Tedesco in three of the seven pieces of litigation that are pending. Uh, uh, True North is, as you all know, a locally based company that's desiring to relocate its corporate headquarters to the city of Phoenix. I just want to briefly reiterate uh, the uh, uh, arguments that we already set forth in opposition to this petition in a letter that we had directed to the council earlier, uh, and also indicate our support for Councilwoman Gallego's uh, motion in both of its parts, including the part about uh, supporting the Chinese cultural uh, effort. Uh, as you know, our client has already made both practical and financial commitments to uh, support uh, and preserve the artworks that are uh, currently located in the garden at the center. We think that uh, the petition that was submitted to you has uh, got three major flaws with it. The first one is that it's a bad idea generally for this council to be in the business of arbitrating business disagreements. We're about five hours into this meeting already. If you start arbitrating every business disagreement that occurs in the city of Phoenix, you will never get anything else done. Uh, that is a floodgate that I do not think you want to open. The second reason that we would be concerned about the petition is that we think it's a bad idea in this specific situation because the city of Phoenix is a defendant in this litigation, at least in two of the pieces of litigation along with our clients. We do not think that it is a wise idea for the city to take sides publicly through the council, either for or against any party to, that, to those pieces of litigation. You have able counsel who can advise you on this subject, of course, but I would discourage you from doing it. Lastly, uh, as uh, was just indicated to you by Chris, uh, we think it's a bad idea because of the substance of what has gone on in this case. Specifically, uh, in three of the seven pieces of litigation, trial courts have already ruled in our favor. 
The forcible detainer action against the restaurant has been upheld in our favor. The federal uh, trial court judge has dismissed discrimination claims against our client. And in the uh, CCNR litigation, the trial court judge has already ruled in our favor as well. The courts are doing their jobs. We suggest that you allow them to continue. Thank you. Mayor, may I ask a question? Could you, um, Mr. Anderson, elaborate on what you just said about the, the forcible detainer? Uh, Mayor, Mayor Williams, uh, Councilman Gallego, uh, I can. Uh, just in full candor, uh, Mr. Payne is handling that litigation, but okay. my I, understanding maybe is- Maybe the question should be for Mr. Payne. Do you wanna, yeah. Let's, let's go to the source. Councilwoman Gallego, how, how can I help you? Could you, uh, um, Mr. Anderson mentioned litigation over a forcible detainer. Could you sort of, I guess, give us the whole status of that litigation and just elaborate a little bit more on? Absolutely, Your Honor. I'm sorry, Your Honor. Uh, we don't need a promotion. Councilman no. Gallego, I'm used to being in court. My apologies. Uh, yes, let me give you a quick layout of, of that litigation. We were sued by Beijing Gardens, uh, Chef Tian in that case, uh, asking for an injunction to prevent us from using our statutory rights, our self-help remedy to lock um, Beijing Gardens out uh, at the end of their lease, which was at the end of January. I should note that I personally wrote letters to their council extending an opening to allow them to stay, indicating quite clearly that we were willing to and wanted to work with them to allow that business to continue and stay in place, but for some period less than what they thought that they were entitled to, which, which was a five-year extension of the lease. We got no response to our offer to discuss some way to resolve that situation. As part of the litigation proceedings, we also brought a claim which is known as forcible detainer. It's typically known as the eviction action. That was heard in a summary fashion before a commissioner, and all of the arguments were considered about whether they were entitled to an extension or not. What the court found is they were not entitled to an extension, that the lease expired on January 31st, 2018, and that for every day after that, that they continued to occupy the premises, they were guilty of forcible detainer, and that we would be entitled to evict them. Between that ruling and, uh, and now, we were able to use our rights to lock them out. So we, we now have possession of that, we have possession of the equipment which we actually owned and we were allowing the tenant to use. We have offered to try to relocate the tenant, provide them with the equipment, and there's a, a pending request for over $90,000 as damages in that case that we've indicated would be willing to waive and transport the equipment to a new location to allow Beijing Gardens to continue their business just in another location. And so that's the status of that. Uh, next is Joanna Dong. No. I haven't heard the council ask for a rebuttal, so I'll uh, ask Tom to go ahead. Pure fallacy. What you just heard is an utter complete disinformation by Mr. Payne. He didn't mention to you that that case is before the appellate court right now. Why didn't he mention that to you? Ask yourself whether you're being dealt truthfully with. This business of him taking the equipment that they owned, Chef Tian wrote a $4,800 check for that equipment. He has it and they stole his equipment. Now they're saying, that they're telling you, the council, that they own that equipment? Ridiculous. There is no way to interpret what the judge said to Mr. Payne, but that they were criminally wrong. The judge said, no, criminally wrong. No, I mean ridiculously criminally wrong. For Mr. Payne to stand up here and tell you that the judge said to him that he, that he was criminally wrong in a hypothetical, when you have the transcript in front of you saying otherwise, 
is a distortion of the facts, purposeful, and you should be cautious about somebody who was willing to come before this body and utterly lie to you about the status of the situation. And ask yourself one more time, why did he stand up here for that much time and not tell you that this was on appeal? We've already won another appeal against them, which keeps them from destroying the outside of the property. We'll win this next appeal. But don't be fooled, City Council. Don't be fooled. Thank you. Joanna Dong, please. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Joanna. This is my second time to speak at the hearing. We are here together to fight for the Chinese Cultural Center again. We do not only want our voice to be heard, but also want our problem to be solved. We want the government to, to protect the human rights, treat people equally, and effectively respond, respond to people's reasonable expectations and appeals. First, let me start our conversation from gratitude. I would like to express my thanks to all the people that made every effort to save the Chinese Cultural Center. Even, I should be thankful to the True North Company. Learning to be grateful throughout this issue changed the way we interpret our life. Thanks to the intention of True North to demolish the Chinese Cultural Center, more and more people are realizing how wonderful the, and valuable the Chinese Cultural Center is. Because of this issue, the Chinese Americans and Americans of Heritage who share the same values are united as a family to fight for saving the beautiful garden and never compromise this priceless treasure that belongs to all humankind. Because of this issue, our young generations gained the opportunities to, to develop leadership and practice public speaking skills through this defense campaign. The more hard won something, the more it is doubly treasured. Secondly, let me talk about beliefs. Maybe money talks way too loud in True North to hear the voice of determination to save the Chinese Cultural Center. Let me explain how important and meaningful it is. My whole family formally became Buddhist when I was four years old. As any other religion advocated, Buddha teaches us the meaning of truth, beauty, and goodness in his scriptures. The pursuit of truth, beauty, and goodness runs through each social life of human. This Chinese Children's Center fully demonstrates what truth, good, and beauty looks like. Fully reflects the Phoenix City of the unique historical background, spiritual outlook, and multicultural charm. That's why we do not want this precious Chinese Cultural Center to be demolished. The fish in the pond are still locked inside the garden. Without food, they are probably dead. Without belief, freedom, culture, soul, and love, people will be just like these fish, breaking our heart and struggling for breath within turbid environment. We, the people, expect the government, government be impartial and treat us equally. I am proud of the ancient Chinese culture and love learning it. There was a Chinese saying, which means great virtue can carry heavy responsibilities. Thank you. Very good I'm job. Done. I'm almost done. Almost done? All right. I wrote this in Chinese calligraphy for Miss Galigo as a gift. I want you to know, people will vote, trust, and support someone that has great virtue, treat people equally, and carry out duties conscientiously. Can someone give this to Miss Galigo? Yes. We'll have the city clerk come get it. Very nice. Thank Respect you very much. One more thing. Is it quick? Yes. All right. Respect the city council members. How did you educate your young kids? Have you taught them what is truth, beauty, and goodness? Have you taught them to fight for the human rights? Have you taught them to, to preserve their faith, to respect all their culture, and embrace cultural diversity? Now, not just saying those in words, it's time to show your actions to young generations and all your residents in Phoenix. Work out the effective solution to save the garden, preserve history and culture, bring harmony back to Phoenix. Let us go forward together to champion these freedoms for our time, for all people. The Chinese Cultural Center, wishing you last forever. Thank you. Okay, please hold the applause, although she deserves it. Uh, I have one card that doesn't want to speak, James Stipler, so. <laughs> okay, come on. Uh, 
Hello, I am James Dibler. I live in Phoenix, Arizona in Council District 5. True no properties is discriminating discriminating against Chinese American citizens. They force Chinese American for going out of business by shutting down the phone lines and internet access. They force people to move out of the building. It's time for the city of Phoenix to stand up against two North properties to make sh sure there is no, no discrimination against Chinese American people. If the deal between two North properties in the city of Phoenix doesn't work out, the city of Phoenix would purchase the Chinese culture center from two North properties to preserve the buildings and the garden. Thanks for your time and consideration. Thank you very much, James. Okay, is council? I, I'll say something. Okay. Yeah, just as a couple things. One, I'm just gonna give everybody a historical prefer uh, reference here. It's been a long day, so if I don't say it correctly, it's just because I'm tired. And I'm amazed my kids are actually able to sit through the meeting too, you know, but how old are you? Oh my gosh, you're amazing. Yeah, you, your mom has to be very proud of you. You know, very, very proud. I mean, that's just amazing what you did. So let's just go back in time just a little bit. I was the one, because nobody else wanted to, this was back in the 90s, no one understood it, no one understood how to put a project like that together and get the city of Phoenix involved. Plus there were political considerations when we first did the Chinese Cultural Center. So I was the one at the point of bringing them in, negotiating, putting them in place, and putting them in the location that they are there. So I have a lot of history with it, and I'm enamored with the center. I love it. I think it's fantastic. I think it's beautiful. Uh, had, it, had we not done that, and at the time, the council member at the time didn't really want to get that involved in it because it dealt with the Chinese um, government. And we were, you know, at, you know, basically at a type of Cold War with them at the time. And nobody really wanted to touch it. Uh, I thought it was a great cultural center. There was even some division at the time between the Ta Taiwanese Chinese and the Chinese mainland Chinese. And even then it was controversial. There was, you know, why are you getting involved? Why are you doing this? So I have a lot of history with the center. I mean, a lot of history, I wanna see it. I, I think it's beautiful. Let's fast forward now, and this is in defense of Councilwoman Gallego. The only thing that she could do is what she did today. Legally, constitutionally, that was it. Uh, to have the city of Phoenix get involved in anything more than what is constitutionally allowed, I think would be wrong for the city. We don't have the ability as a council member or as a council to subpoena individual, make sure people are telling the truth. They're not telling the truth. That's what the court systems are for. You have two things here. One is the Chinese Cultural Center itself. When this entire situation came about, I think you remember where my statements were, we need to find a way to preserve it, find a way to make it work. I engaged. I know it was in Councilman Gallego's district, but because of the affinity I had with the center, I wanted to take it personal. I wanted to take it to a personal level and engage on it myself. I met with uh, True North. I worked well, some, I believe, a phenomenal agreement to save parts of it. They weren't gonna save the entire building. They just weren't going to do that. They came in, they bought it from a Chinese company. Remember that, they bought it from uh, Kafka at the time. They purchased it from the Chinese government that sold it to them, knowing full well what they were going to do with it. And it, some individuals were aware of that too. So I came in there trying to save the garden, which I think is beautiful. They had agreed to that. They said, hey, we will save the garden. We will work with you on this. We will save certain parts of it, but we're still going to make the changes as a private owner, go in and make the changes inside. And they were going, and the tile I know is an issue because that was shipped over from China. I was part of that, helping it get across. We worked with the US Senate offices at the time in order to get that tile across. I was amazed by it, I thought it was beautiful, but still that is an issue that's still in the courts right now. So you're dealing with the actual saving of the cultural center itself. I thought I had an agreement. I met with Paul Gilbert, who was the attorney at the time, representing the Chinese community. 
And he even told me, he said, Sal, I don't know how much better we can get than this. I, and I said, this is just a starting point because I think that there are other things that we might be able to get out of True North if we're willing to sit down. The Chinese community said, no. We want to sit down with them. We want all or nothing. And that's why we're here today. That's one part of it. The second part of it deals with Mr. Simon and his complaint as a restaurant owner and a um, property owner. Again, involving us, we cannot legally get involved in a, a dispute between, this is a civil matter between the, um, the restaurant owner and the property owner. You have two issues that are you know, kind of commingled together and I'm trying to separate them because I still believe, and I don't know, we cannot get involved, Mr. Simon, in that part of the dispute, it just, just isn't gonna happen. It's not legal, it's not, it wouldn't even be proper for us to get involved in a civil dispute, otherwise we're gonna be hearing multiple civil disputes forever at the city. But when you deal with the Chinese Cultural Center, I was asked a question even last, as of last week, by one of the editorial writers of the Arizona Republic. They said, Sal, would you be willing to engage at some point, and where would you be willing to go? I said, hey, I'm all in favor of moving forward, and if it, it requires us to find work with them again, or it requires us to find another location for the Chinese community, I said, I am all in to do that. Uh, there are certain bond monies that are going to be made available that could possibly be used with that as long as we do some sort of match. We walk through a lot of scenarios. And I was asked another question. He said, do you think it's time? I said, no, it's not, because right now people are still at war and they're still working it through the legal system. The legal system needs to be worked out. You have my commitment that I will continue to work with you as members of the Chinese community. I will do that. I, did it back in the 90s, I will do it again because I believe strongly that we need that type of diversity in our city. But at the same time, you cannot ask us to get involved in a legal matter between two parties when we don't even have an ability, again, to subpoena individuals, to bring them into court, to make sure people are telling the truth or not telling the truth. We don't have that ability to do that. We are not the forum for that. And it's done that way constitutionally. We have a separation of powers. We have an executive power, legislative power, and a judicial power. And this is where it's at right now. Until this is resolved through the courts, there's really nothing the city of Phoenix can do. It's just not. If you're asking us to stop them to do things, you're asking us to do something that would take away their rights as individuals. And we're just not gonna do that as a body, even though we believe strongly that we'd like to find a way to save this. But remember, I engaged early on on this and tried to find a solution and was told no. And that's just, you got to sit down. You never know what the other side's willing to give you until you're willing to sit down and figure it out. So we could not even get into the room to start a negotiation to do that. And this is why we're here today. So I am disappointed because I really believe then, and I do believe now, that we have an ability to make something work. I believe that. Otherwise, I wouldn't be up here talking about this. I wasn't going to say anything today. I just wasn't. But I'm going to because I just have to at this point. Because I've heard this case repeatedly as a council member, and I just don't, what you're asking us to do is not, it's just not legal or it's, it's just not constitutional. And until it's resolved in the courts, and unless you're willing to sit down and work out something with the other side. I still think that I can get them to the table, but I think everybody hates each other right now. And sometimes things have to take its way, its course, and its time in order for it to be worked out. That's why I think that the motion on the table that Councilwoman Gallego, to her defense, I don't think it's fair for her to get beat up today, even though we don't agree politically on a lot of things. But at the same time, to her defense, She's only doing what she can possibly do, and she's trying to leave the door open for the Chinese community to come to the table and work with us. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for the comments. Um, is there any question about the motion? All right, roll call. DeCicio. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Let me explain my, my vote. I'm gonna be voting yes on this, but it's because it's a, Can we go ahead and let Jim vote first? <laughs> go ahead and let Jim vote first. Okay, there. I'm going to be voting yes because I believe that um, Councilmember Gallegos found that win-win situation that we as the City of Phoenix can do. Legally, we're not able to step into this as Sal explained it to you all. 
but we'll continue. I think every single one of us up here want to find that win-win situation for, for our community and for the Chinese community because when you all have a cultural center, it benefits all of us. And, it, and it's such a great place to go to. So I'm going to be supporting that for that reason. Pastor. Yes. Dark. Yes. Valenzuela. Waring. Did you repeat that? Was that a yes or no? We couldn't distinguish what your answer was. Did you vote yes or no? Are you asking me? Yes. I voted no. Okay. You come back. Sorry, the reception across. was the best. I apologize. No, that's okay. There we are. Yes. So it passes seven to one. Okay. Uh, that's the end of the formal agenda. We are back to citizen comments. And we have four cards. Leonard Clark. Hello, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Leonard Clark. I'm here to speak in defense of Police Chief Jerry Williams. Unfortunately, our police chief is doing the right thing. We do have many good officers, but the militarization that has occurred of our officers, just as it is occurring across the country, due to that individual in the White House who is encouraging law-breaking himself. Please be quiet. We, yes, I would ask my Trump friends to please, I would be silent while you speak. Please do not take away my First Amendment right. Thank you. I would ask that Chief Jerry Williams, that if they try this Phoenix Law Enforcement Association, and there are many good officers who do put their lives on the line, I'm here not only for those law-abiding officers, but for the law-abiding citizens who should not to tolerate being beat down anymore and the injustices done to them. So I'm asking that uh, the police chief, Jerry Williams, let her investigations go through. I believe that officers should be given the benefit of the doubt. But I do not want this police chief to be fired, such as the other police chiefs. This shows that the power of the Phoenix Law Enforcement Association to come after people like myself and others is now too great. We are the last major city in the United States of America, one of the last major cities, to not have a civilian oversight Phoenix Law Enforcement uh, Oversight Board. Now, it has been made the argument that there is a board which oversees that, but it has no enforcement powers. So I ask you to please do this not only for the people that they serve, but for the good officers who are afraid to speak up, who if they see somebody being beat down like that was in Mesa, will not be afraid of the Brotherhood taking them and putting them on some list. And furthermore, I have heard, I believe there is a list, an enemies list, that the Phoenix Law Enforcement Association has. It comes after people like myself for having the audacity as a citizen to just speak up and ask for justice. I'm not on the left, I'm not on the right, so I will be attacked by both. I'm in the most difficult position, and that is the one that just asks that they serve the people without brutality, without unnecessary killing. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to murder this name, Art Men Menno. Oh, Manny? Sorry. My name is Art Manny. I'm in the uh, District 6 and a longtime resident there in the Ahwatukee Mountain Park Ranch. And I might, I might point out that sitting here for over five hours waiting to speak and my councilman has left. So I'm not very happy. Um, I'm here to talk about enhanced school safety. Uh, but before I do that, and since I waited so long, let me make a couple of preambles if I could. One is... Thank God for our law enforcement and first responders. I don't know what we would do without them. That's number one. Number two, we do need more police officers in Phoenix. Uh, I can tell you that Mountain Park Ranch in the Ahwatukee area has three patrol officers for the whole area. We wait hours for any kind of service. I understand that you're trying to get more officers. I believe you have 125 recs available. And my understanding is that you're having trouble filling them. Well, let me point out that you, Mayor, and the council people need to make sure that our cadets, our uh, recruits, the people in training, the candidates for those positions know that you have their backs and that unlike the prior mayor, you're going to support them. 
On the situation with school safety, I made a proposal last week to the District 6 group, Sam and his people, Sal's people, and I told them I have a proposal that will enhance school safety with very little, if any, impact on the budget. It involves a, a, a process using current assets and using volunteer resources, so the impact would be very, very minimal. First two things they told me was, Art, it's going to take 9 to 12 months, 9 to 12 months with the City Council to get any of this stuff reviewed. And I said, why does it take that long? We protect our, citizens, our government, we protect our millionaires, our billionaires, we protect our money in the banks, but we can't protect our elementary school kids. So listen to my appeal, please. Can you accelerate the process? It's, it's a minimum to zero impact on the budget. We can use current assets. We can use volunteers for the resources. We can make this work. So I would ask for a special council meeting where I can brief them on my proposal. It's very straightforward. I've gone through all of the what ifs, all of the devil advocacy stuff, and I can come up with the answers and I can help you make schools safer. What is more precious than our elementary students? I have three grandchildren going to elementary schools, and I think every day about things that we can do to make them safer. So please, would you listen to my appeal? Set up a meeting. If you're too busy to listen to me, have each of your staffers meet with me. I'll meet them whenever they want, wherever they want, and I'll go through the proposal very straightforward. It's a deterrent. It'll address stuff like keeping criminals out of schools. It'll uh, address the problem. To wrap up. It'll address the problem that we have with speeding in school zones. And God forbid, it should deter to some degree active shooters. And I'll tell you right now, let me make the proposal. I'll be there when you want me to be there. Thank I'm you. asking you to get with Brian Jeffries. Raise your hand. He's on my Hi, staff, Brian. get the proposal to him, meet with him, explain it, and then we can make a recommendation if it could go uh, through the police department or to the public safety committee for review. Okay. It probably couldn't happen before September because we have a summer break, the council does. We're not here during July and most of August, uh, but that's faster than what was promised to you. Yeah, wouldn't it be a shame if we, if again, another school year goes by oh, when we don't do one. something that's no. cost effective uh, to enhance safety yeah. in schools? Well, get with Brian. Okay, and yes, I have a uh, copy we, of the proposal no so I can so show him. Thank you. you. explain it to him and you can set up a meeting and we can expedite uh, for consideration. won't promise you we can do it, but I will tell you that we can expedite Thank you. it. Thank you, Mary. Thank you very much. And Thank the way you. I understand school safety, since I sit on the school board, is school safety is an uh, individual piece by districts. In addition to that, uh, uh, SROs are funded by grants. They're not funded by general fund money. Am I correct? Right. Yeah. Well, and maybe I could respond okay, if that was a question. Saying, okay. So, but thank you for coming down, and thank you for sitting through all of this. James Stibler? Hello, I am James Dibler. I live in Phoenix, Arizona, in Council, Council District 5. Congratulations, Fire Wellness, for no intermair position. Two weeks ago, I heard that on the news that IKEA decided to now build a new store in Glendale, Arizona. IKEA is making a wrong decision for for not building a second store in Phoenix metropolitan area, instead focusing online sales and building new stores in urban city centers. It would be nice to have a IKEA at Metro Center. IKEA will help to revive the shopping centers with new opportunities and new winter jobs into the area. That light well is coming to Metro Center with new development into the area. The city of Phoenix 
political officials need to work with a developer to bring a IKEA superstore at Metro Center. The school spot to pull a IKEA supercenter is at the Sears department store. This Sears at Metro Center Mall will close in early September 2018 due to declining sales. I hope corporate officials at IKEA will change their mind about building a new store in Phoenix metropolitan area with a right location closer to the urban city centers. The city of Phoenix and Glendale Westlands don't want to drive to Tempe to get their furniture and home decor needs. The new IKEA location should be central located without traveling to Glendale. Finally, I say thank you to Phoenix Councilman South Digicio for fixing up the sidewalks at 7th Street in Missouri near Walgreens. I got injured while I was walking north to the bus stop on Glenda Avenue. It will take time for my right elbow to heal from my injuries. I find more broken sidewalks between 3 and 5th Avenue and Tarkin Lane in Phoenix Council District 5. I hope the city of Phoenix will take care of that problem soon before someone will get injured. Thanks for the time and consideration. Thank you very much, James. Jack Freeman, thank you for your patience for waiting all this time. Good evening, my name is Jack Freeman, and uh, I'll say you, uh, Mayor and City Council and the rest of the staff that's here, including the police officers, uh, thank you for the time that you put in. I have a tremendous amount of respect for you. Um, my name is Jack Freeman. I'm a minister of the Church of the Light of the World and director of public relations. You might know us better as Iglesia del Dios Vivo, which is the large silver dome off the side of the freeway by the 7th Street. Um, we're having an event this Sunday at the convention center. Um, we have 13 locations here in Arizona where all of the members are coming together. Our international director is going to be there to uh, have a social slash spiritual service to talk about uh, what our motto is, a good Christian makes a good citizen. And uh, we have sent invitations to each and every one of you. And uh, I know that today the proclamation was finished and I'm eternally grateful. I'm so happy. But uh, I wanted to take one more opportunity to extend the invitation. I know your time is very busy. It's hard to find even a minute to see your families. And tonight's an example of that. But uh, if your plans, some of you have already said you were coming, and I'm very grateful. But if for the rest, your plans change and you have the opportunity to come, we'd like to extend it to all of your staff and the members that are here, especially the police officers who, and the firemen and the sheriff department, which is a, a vital part of this community that takes care of us. So um, we want to, and the reasoning behind this, and I know a lot of times people will try to do it as a publicity stunt to get a politician or, or somebody there that is recognizable for the media, which will be there, but our intentions are to create relationships that are going to grow. We preach to the members to be very active within the communities, to get involved with projects, to find areas where our beliefs and your passions parallel so that we can work together in something that we have in common. We all have our own faith and our own beliefs, but there has to be common ground somewhere. And so that's why we'd like you to come and, and meet us and see who we are. Uh, there's a lot of questions, who's in the Silver Dome, and this is going to get you an opportunity to see who we are. So it is um, this Sunday at 10 o'clock in the North uh, Hall, in Hall E. We're expecting about 3,500 people, and we hope that you're one of them. So God bless you, and God pay you for the time. Thank you very much. We're adjourned. <laughs>